chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Crown the Clown Written by Elias Withrow Performed by Galen Scott Carter I was always a spoiled kid. My parents were wealthy and decided to spend their money smothering their only son with an incredible childhood. I had it all. My playroom was insane. A huge TV, pinball machines, and every toy you could imagine. It was awesome. Despite having so much, I wasn't a brat about it. I can say that now, having thoroughly examined my childhood. I loved to share my immense stash of stuff with my friends. I gave toys away, invited them over for pizza and movies, and was all around pretty generous. On paper, I should have been a spoiled snob. But for whatever reason, I wasn't. Good genes, I guess. On my ninth birthday, I had a bunch of my friends over. My dad rented a huge moon bounce for us and decorated our backyard with superhero apparel. I was going through a major phase. Tables were set up with punch and snacks, little finger foods to keep us from complaining until dinner. Balloons and banners were tied to every surface. My parents' way of establishing how loved I was. Music played from giant speakers my dad had set up on the back patio. My friends and I ran around and jammed out while waiting our turn in the moon bounce. My grandparents arrived a couple hours into the party, bringing with them a party gift. My grandmother informed me she had purchased yeah, it at a yard sale the weekend, weekend prior. Off of I it was a giant hollow plastic clown head. It looked like one of those weird cheap toys from the 90s, something that was popular for a week before getting all of its units shelved. Its face was white with red circles lining the painted eyes. A smile was smeared to its lips, a big goofy grin that was also painted red. The nose was a bulbous orb of plastic that sat oddly on its face like a giant gumball. As I turned over this strange gift in my hands, my grandfather handed me a plastic gold crown. He said it was part of the game. Seeing my confusion, my grandmother laughed and explained what it was. She said I was supposed to wear the clown head while my friends attempted to sneak up and crown me. I flipped the head over and saw serrated notches lining the bald dome where the crown went. I thought it was pretty lame, but didn't want to be rude. I dutifully slid the plastic clown head over my own, the interior hard against my temples. As it settled over me, I realized I couldn't see anything. Red light filtered through the plastic, but there was a concerning lack of eye holes. My grandfather chuckled as he watched me stumble around, hands outstretched so I wouldn't bump into anything. I asked why there were no eye holes and he told me it'd be too easy for me to win the game. I had to rely on my ears to keep my friends at bay. He said the game was called Crown the Clown. I was beginning to understand the rules. It was like some weird version of pin the tail on the donkey, but with a clown and a crown instead. My friends had gathered around to watch me, and soon they were laughing and calling out for me. My grandmother tossed one of them the crown and the game began. It was surprising fun. The plastic mask got hot, but I didn't mind. I was too caught up in keeping my friends away from me and the crown off my head. After 20 minutes passed and still no one had managed to get me, I was laughing and stumbling around, doing my best not to bump into anything. My friend John was calling out to me, and I didn't know if he had the crown or if he was trying to distract me. Turns out, he was trying to distract me. I suddenly felt something click over my head, followed by a great cheer from my friends. I had finally been crowned. Smiling despite my defeat, I went to take the big plastic head off me, but found that I couldn't. The neck hole was suddenly smaller, curling tight under my chin and biting into my skin. 
I tugged harder, trying not to panic. The air inside the head had already grown thick. I wrapped my fingers around the base of the head, pulling up as hard as I could. I felt rough edges cut into me, and I immediately stopped. I could hear my friends laughing at me. I'm sure I looked ridiculous, but at that time, I didn't find any humor in the situation. Sweat dripped into my eyes, and I blinked against the burning sensation. My breath blew back at me from the tight walls of the head. The red light filtering through the eye paint, making me dizzy and disoriented. I was suddenly very aware of how claustrophobic the clown head was. I called out for someone to help me, doing my best to keep panic from my voice. Still laughing, one of my friends came to my aid. I felt his hands around my ears and suddenly I screamed as he jerked upward. Pain exploded around my face and I shoved him away from me, panting. Why couldn't I get this thing off me? It had been so easy to put on, sliding comfortable over my head with little room to spare. But now everything was squishing in on me, the opening flush against my throat. I suddenly realized my nose was bent against the plastic, bent painfully to the right. I then understood what was happening. The clown head was shrinking. I screamed for someone to get my dad, sweat pouring from my face. The head stunk, and the combination of unfiltered breath and sweat made me lightheaded. My throat was parched, but my lips were lined with perspiration. I felt the burning fingers of claustrophobia wrap around my mind. The head squeezed a little tighter. I screamed again for my dad, my vision obscured by the head. I suddenly heard him in the front of me and felt his hands trace the outer surface of my prison. His voice changed from amusement to worry in a matter of seconds, and that scared me even more. I tried tugging at the head again, yelling into the plastic dome, explaining that it was getting tighter and tighter. My dad heard the panic in my voice, and I felt him uselessly struggle to remove my source of agony. His fingers traced the now compressed opening at the bottom. He tried to slide his fingers between the lip of the base and my skin, but just ended up choking and gagging me as his knuckles burrowed into my throat. The clown head's grip on my head tightened further. I wheezed and sunk to my knees, the heat and lack of oxygen causing my head to swim. My dad was yelling at my friends, instructing them to go retrieve something from the woodshed. I didn't hear much, instead concentrating on my breathing. My head throbbed as the hard plastic compressed my skull like a grape waiting to pop. I heard my mom's concerned voice, a shrill inquiry that my dad ignored. I felt his fingers try to pry the head off my throat again. He could tell I was fading. Panic cracked his voice as he yelled at my friends to hurry. His fingers were back at my throat, digging desperately, trying to give me some kind of relief. I knelt before him, swaying slightly and sucking in hot, stinking air. Suddenly, my father tried to jam his hand further in, and I felt my gag reflex engage and my stomach rolled as I dry retched into the hot plastic. My body hitched, and I felt another wave coming. I tried to fight it, but it was like trying to stop a train. I vomited into the mask, regurgitated soda and pretzels gushing into the tight space. I gasped, and the smell alone brought another gout rocketing from my lips. It sloshed around my face, filled my ears, the hot bile splashing against my skin with nowhere to go. It was trapped inside the head along with me, and I was drowning in it. It came to just above my nostrils, a slimy yellow line below my eyes. My father heard me gurgling inside the head and quickly laid me on my back, the vomit pouring around my ears and giving me a pocket to breathe. I gasped in the putrid air and felt the plastic tighten again, a wet, hard compress that began to fill my vision with darkness. I felt my strength begin to leave my body. My head was wrapped with an iron grip, and I didn't know how much longer I'd last in its clutches. Suddenly, my friend returned with the item my father had asked for. I heard him instructing me, his voice drowned out by the puke in my ears. He slowly turned me on my side, and I coughed and gagged against the slurping vomit. My nose felt like it was breaking against the walls of my prison. My ears burned and sweat coated my skin. I felt my father slide something cold and hard along the side of my neck, just under the lip of the head. I immediately knew what it was. 
a crowbar. I grit my teeth, tears pouring from my eyes as my dad apologized, his voice cracking with desperation. I howled as he applied pressure, the crowbar burrowing into my neck muscles. To my relief, I felt the mass give a little, just a slight lift that allowed some of the vomit to trickle out. Suddenly, the clown head tightened again, squeezing my skull harder than I could bear. I thrashed on the ground, screaming in agony, clawing at my head. I felt like my skull would explode from the pressure and the darkness swam closer. I heard my father instruct my friends to hold me still as he readjusted the crowbar. Sweaty hands penned me to the earth as my head was pushed sideways. I felt my father hovering over me, the cold tongue of the crowbar licking the side of my neck. My father was apologizing over and over. I knew something bad was about to happen. My muscles bulged in revolt as my dad jammed the crowbar under the lip, digging into my skin and drawing blood. He shoved it in until I felt its hard surface resting against my cheek. I tensed, warm blood streaming down my neck across my shoulders. I heard my father whisper into my ear to brace myself. Suddenly, overwhelming pressure cut into the side of my face, and I thrashed violently, clutching and tearing out handfuls of grass as pain shot across my cheek and neck like spreading lightning. The edge of the crowbar crunched into my jaw as my father applied pressure, a last-ditch effort to remove the clown head before it killed me. Tears ran down my face, and red darkness shook my world. Puke and sweat coated my face as I tried to escape the pain. My friends held me in place and I heard one of them crying. My teeth cracked against each other as my father continued to pull upward. With a sickening popping sound, I heard my jaw break and suddenly I was taken to a level of splintering agony I didn't know existed. My tongue waggled and went numb in my mouth. I felt molar tear free from my gums. It tumbled across my tongue like bloody candy. I felt howling darkness rush me as it swallowed me. I felt the sudden surge of cool air as the clown head cracked and finally shattered. As I blacked out, I felt my father shaking me, clutching me in his arms. His voice faded into the nothing. I awoke in the hospital a few hours later my face wrapped and contorted around some plastic that kept my jaw in place. I felt woozy and sick, an IV bag by my bed dripping relief into my bloodstream. My mother and father were at my side, eyes bloodshot and filled with concern. My grandparents sat on the other side of the bed, my grandmother crying. As soon as they saw I was awake, they began to apologize all at once my father for doing what he did and my grandparents for exposing me to such horrors. Their voices all babbled into one and I let my eyes close once again, the drugs pumping through my body, lulling me into a comfortable sleep. Thinking back on that day, I can still feel that horrible clown head, the way it smelled, the way the light filtered through the plastic the weight of it resting across my skull. It's like one sick joke now. All these years later, now that I've recovered from the event, I can't help but feel disgusted amusement. Because you see, my jaw has never healed properly, and there's twisted scar tissue lining my cheek where the crowbar cut into me. My jaw is in a constant state of crooked humor, like a painful half smile, combined with the scar tissue stretching from my lips. Well, some would say I look kind of like a clown. Warwood Elementary, written by Michael Guidry. Performed by Nick Goroff. I honestly don't know where to begin. I'll start with the basic stuff. My name is Alex. 
I'm 22 years old. From 1999 till 2003, I attended a small elementary school in Georgia called Warwood Elementary. It was a private but non-religious school, around maybe 300 kids total at the time. I was an only child, and my parents were divorced. I never saw my dad after the split, and my mom engaged a new boyfriend, but they never married. Just stayed engaged. Anyways, I don't remember my first year at Warwood very clearly. I was in kindergarten. I made a friend named Tony, and we stuck together up until I moved in 2004. I'm not going to waste your time with useless details about my life, though. I'm going to tell you about the weird stuff. First grade, the year 2000. Tony and I were in Miss Anderson's class. She was in her 30s, had short hair, kind of looked like Jamie Lee Curtis in her later years. She was extraordinarily sweet and compassionate. Parents and students alike loved her. Different grades had different recess times at Warwood. Pre-K through second grade had it at 11.30 through 12, and third through fifth had it at 12 through 12.30. Our playground was massive, despite our small classes. The main playground island had a slide, a bridge, ladders, monkey bar, and a huge plastic rock dome with little dinosaur bones on the ceiling beneath it. It was the Dino Dome, as we called it. Tony and I would meet up there with Scotty and Phil, our friends from second grade. Both Scotty and Phil had older siblings. Scotty's brother was in fourth grade, and Phil's sister was in fifth. Both had attended Warwood since pre-K. Sometime during my first grade year, I remember a rumor went around about the bad chair. and Scotty was positive that his brother Mark had been sent to it. I first heard of the bad chair at lunchtime, right after recess. I think a boy named Eddie mentioned it to me in a hushed tone. Alex, you know about the bad chair? I shook my head. Many of my responses to adults and children alike were motions instead of words. Uh, I was rather shy. You want to know about the bad chair? I nodded. Okay, you know the teacher's place near the girls' potty room? The teacher's place was a small break room or staff room for teachers. Small place, probably had a fridge and a bathroom. I nodded again. Well, some kid says he's seen inside there. He says there's another door. Impossible, I thought. No child, living or dead, had seen into the teacher's place. How'd he see it, I asked, unbelieving. He had to go to the potty on his way back to Mrs. Tudor's class... He saw a teacher go in. When the door opened, he says there was a table, chairs, and another door. So? So that's where the bad chair is. I still don't know what that is. You know J-Boy? J-Boy was a very misbehaved fourth grader. Everybody knew who he was. Just that week, he'd been expelled for bad behavior. Uh Uh-huh. Remember how I messed up Mrs. Ludke's desk last week? And then how he used his Boy Scout stuff to set all the tests on fire. Uh Uh-huh. Well, he got something worse in detention. Well, yeah, he got kicked out. Eddie giggled condescendingly. That's what they want you to think. They? The teachers. J-Boy doesn't even live here anymore. He lives at the hospital now. Why? The bad chair. Of course, then the lunch was over, leaving me with an undying curiosity about the bad chair. I think that was a Friday. So after the weekend came and went, I met up with my pals in the Dino Dome and asked if they had heard about the bad chair and J-Boy's fate. Someone told me about that. I think it's a big fat fib, Tony announced, crossing his arms. Eddie told me a little, but he had to go when he reached the good stuff. What is the bad chair? Then from the side of the Dino Dome, the bald head of Steve peeked in. Steve was a fifth grader who was really sick and was allowed two recesses. You guys talking about the bad chair? It was extremely rare for a fifth grader, even a special one like Steve, to talk with the likes of first graders. We all froze, stunned to have his attention. You better not let the teachers hear. Why not? Phil squeaked. You might get sent there. Steve scanned the playground and crept inside the Dino Dome. 
And who knows what'll happen after that? What is the bad chair, you guys? I was quite flustered at this point and just wanted to know what the darn thing was, true or not. It's beneath the school. You can only get to it through a door in the teacher's lounge. Yeah, the fifth graders called the teacher's place a lounge. Far too fancy for our taste. And what's it do? I inquired. Bad things. Well, duh. My friends gasped. No one talked to fifth graders like that. Steve, however, didn't seem to care. He once again looked outside of the Dino Dome as if to make sure no teachers were around. You guys know about J-Boy, right? Yeah, we replied simultaneously. He's a hero. If it weren't for him, none of us would know about the bad chair. He's been here a long time, but he's the first one to escape it. Escape it? Yup. After J-Boy did all that bad stuff, everyone in Ludke's class saw him get sent out to the principal's office. But not really. Ludke took him into the lounge, and whoever was in the lounge took him down the stairs to the room with the bad chair. How do you know all this? Tony interrupted, still skeptical. He told his best friend Finn from my class about it before he went crazy. He said that the room they took him to was really dark, except for some candles on the floor. In the middle is the bad chair. It's wooden and has a bunch of leather straps that they tied him into. But on the top, where your head goes, there's a skull. A human skull? Phil shuddered. Steve frowned. No. No one said anything. Then what? I urged. Then they began. Began what? Dancing. I laughed, thinking this is all a build-up to a big joke. Steve just shook his head. Not funny dancing. Weird dancing. He said they twisted and bent in impossible ways. He said they were wearing black clothes. They were whispering. He screamed, but no one could hear him. He was too far down. How'd he get out? Tony finally looked a little unsettled. Something went wrong, Steve gulped, almost like he were there himself. Something joined them. Hello, boys, Mrs. Chandra, the recess attendant, stepped inside the dino dome. We all screamed. Mrs. Chandra jumped, startled by our cries, then laughed. Steve went pale, paler than usual. Telling scary stories to the young one, Stevie? Mrs. Shonda asked. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Shonda pursed her lips into a smile. Nothing too dark, I hope. Steve shook his head. None of us looked at her. Well, only five more minutes until the young ones go back to class. I suppose you'll be out here with the others, Stephen? Yes, ma'am, replied Steve almost robotically. Any more scary stories? No, ma'am. Good. Very good. With that, Mrs. Chandra patted one of us on the back and left. Steve looked like he was about to cry and ran out of the dino dome. We didn't see him again. The days following our talk with Steve were quiet and seemingly normal. Steve was absent, and most students said that was because of his frequent hospital visits. My friends and I suspected otherwise. Tony, however, raised some good questions regarding the J-Boy situation, though. Why weren't his parents doing anything about this? Surely somebody had told them about all the bad chair rumors. And if other kids had been sent to the bad chair, why didn't they remember? It couldn't have died or vanished, because people would notice the large numbers of disappearances and deaths. As the days passed, we learned more information about the bad chair. Sometimes by kids in our grade, but usually from 4th and 5th graders. Apparently, if the bad chair worked, you didn't remember any of it happening. That was what made the J-Boy thing so important. The first time, something had gone wrong, and he remembered everything. Plenty of other kids had gone, they just didn't know it. Where the 4th and 5th graders received this intel is still unknown to me. A few months went by and the talks of the bad chair and J-Boy died down. We were told by Prinsner Ebner that Steve had spent his last months in hospital fighting hard, but had sadly passed away from cancer. 
Tony concluded that the bad chair was nothing more than a scary story made up by the fifth graders to freak out us younger kids. We just about believed that until the very last day of our first grade year. Summer was approaching fast, so naturally everyone was very excited. And with the excitement comes shenanigans, so to say. But that last day, our first grade class joined with Miss Ludke's second grade class, and we all had a fun little pizza party. We were playing games, singing songs, telling the stories, the usual. Then a second grader named William ran through the classroom door, sobbing. He had left just a few minutes before to use the restroom. All the children looked upset and concerned for our classmate, but Miss Anderson and Miss Ludke just exchanged serious glances. Anderson was the first to approach him. Will, sweetheart, what's wrong? William could hardly stand up, and he had sobbed so hard that he had vomited a little bit onto the carpet. The other kids were grossed out by this and upchucked their own pizza slices. Ludke called for assistance in cleanup while Anderson patted Will on the back and urged him to share what had upset him. Steve, it's Steve, he finally cried, eyes shut tight. What? Miss Anderson tightened her grip on the boy and tried to pull him out into the hall. He shrieked in protest and curled into the fetal position. One of the adults who had been called to the room, a uh, room mom, offered to call his parents. Wait, said Miss Anderson. Let's see if he calms down. The room mom looked a tad bothered by the response, but agreed to wait just a few more minutes. Miss Anderson asked William again what had happened. He finally opened his eyes, which seemed to have been shut for the entirety of his presence. Ludke attempted to distract the rest of us in vain. I saw Steve. I saw Steve, whimpered Will, eyes red and swollen. Steve who? Anderson asked, knowing very well which Steve the child meant. Dead Steve. The room fell silent for Will's sniffles and coughs. Ludke and the other adults escorted us from the classroom while Miss Anderson talked to Will. We all whispered amongst ourselves until we were ordered to remain quiet until our parents arrived. The end of the day had come, and oddly enough, none of us wanted to leave. We needed to know what Will saw. None of us found out, that is, until second grade year started. I haven't much to say about that summer, except that most nights were spent wondering about Will, Steve, and the bad chair. I would ask Tony if he'd heard anything, and he'd ask Phil, who would ask Scotty, but no one had. Day one of second grade, Tony and I met up and started asking around about William, who would now be in third grade with Scotty and Phil. None other than Eddie... The same boy who first told me about the bad chair provided us with the answers. William doesn't go to school here anymore. He's being homeschooled, I think. Why? What happened? This conversation took place in the few minutes we had before class started. He said that while he was taking a pee-pee, he heard weird squishy sounds and growling. When he opened up the door, Dad Steve was on the ground, wiggling about. Only, he wasn't dead. And he wasn't even Steve. How could Steve not be Steve? He was something else, too. Like what? I don't know. No one does. It's all I heard. Steve was both alive and something else. After that, Will started seeing a doctor. And now he's schooled at home. Miss Ludke who was now our teacher, whistled and ordered us all to take our seats. She told us that students would no longer go to the bathroom by themselves, but would always bring a buddy. This was obviously because of the Steve and J boy incidents. During recess for the beginning of the year, Mrs. Shonder would poke her head into the dino dome quite often, even when my pals and I weren't hanging around there. She started doing it so much that we stopped going there altogether and instead walked around the playground at a steady pace if we needed to talk. One day, Scotty said that his older brother, who was now in fifth grade, had been sent to detention for cheating on a test. Scotty asked him what detention was like. Caleb, his brother, said he didn't remember. Said he fell asleep or something. Scotty began crying and started bringing up the bad chair. 
Mrs. Shonder saw us. He doesn't feel well, I told her, when asked what the tears are about. Scotty held his tongue and went along with it. Mrs. Shonder asked if he'd like to see the nurse, offering to walk him back. Scotty refused, but began to cry harder. Then Reese's handed. Mrs. Shonder guided us back to class. Then we saw her go into the teacher's place down the hall. Now this I remember clearly. Just two rooms down, the kindergarten class was having nap time. We were having a math lesson. Miss Ludge was talking about basic fractions or something when all the lights went out. We heard screaming and crying. Lots of it. Ludkey ran out of the room, leaving us with her assistant named Rachel, who told us to remain calm. About three minutes passed before the lights came back on. The screaming and crying had lasted without a single pause for the entire period of darkness. When light returned, they ceased almost immediately. It was the kindergartners, Miss Ludkey told us. They were afraid of the dark. That wasn't even close to what the kindergartners at recess told us. The day following the power outage and screams at recess, my friends and I decided to ask some kindergartners what had caused them so much fright. Many kindergartners were not at school that day, but we managed to find a few who all told an extremely similar story. For the sake of readability, I will change the language and grammar they used to be more coherent. The accounts that follow are obviously not how kindergartners talk, but rather how I edited them. All the details are exactly as they said, just touched up. First we asked a blonde girl, I, I, I don't recall her name. Before nap time started, Miss Natasha prayed for us. This was already a bizarre thing to hear as our school was non-religious. Parents had gotten into fits over any mention of religious activity or influence by teachers. She wasn't praying to God, she was praying to something else. I can't pronounce it. It didn't sound like English. She mentioned Steve, Dead Steve, and J-Boy. And it made us feel weird. Like tingly. Sleepier than we were before. I don't know how long we were asleep before something came. What came? The girl started trembling and looked like she was about to cry. But in an instant she calmed down. Even smiled a bit. It was beautiful, she said. So beautiful. She didn't say much else, but another kindergartner did. Miss Natasha prayed for us before nap time started. I started feeling odd after she mentioned Steve and Jaybor and something else. I don't know how to say it. It was weird, but I got sleepy real fast. Some of my friends closed their eyes, but I fought to keep mine open because I wasn't sleepy before. I kind of had to pee. I pulled my blanket over my head so Miss Natasha wouldn't notice I was awake. The kid had a particularly blank stare and expressionless face. We had found him sitting by the swing set, not doing anything at all. I heard the classroom door open, and Miss Natasha walked out. I, I could tell because I heard her heels clicking against the floor. I took off my blanket, and then something joined. What? What joined? I snapped. Haven't had the answer taken away last time. It knew I was awake. It didn't want me to be awake. I shouldn't have been awake. The boy's pace started to increase, and it was hard to catch every word. He was not in a state of panic like the other child, though. It stood above me. It stood right above me. A heavy weight was on me, but I knew it wasn't touching me. I was scared. I wanted to cry, but I, I didn't... I didn't cry... And I should have been asleep, and we couldn't understand any more after that. We talked to one more kindergartner, and his name I remember. His name was Joshua L. He had tennis ball friends. You know the tennis balls they cut open and put on the legs of chairs? Yeah, he took those off and drew eyes on them and talked to them. We saw him do it at recess a lot. Anyway, we talked to him... And every time he said something, he moved the mouths of his tennis ball friends. We were getting ready to sleep when Miss Natasha said a prayer for us. Her God is a funny name, and he cares about dead Steve and Jay. 
I got all warm and jingly, so I closed my eyes to sleep, and then I slept. And then something came, Tony interjected. Joshua put one of his tennis balls right in Tony's face. Yes, yes, something did. I know this because we all woke up and the lights were off. Miss Natasha had left them on. I didn't know where she was. Then we all screamed. All of us. At first we didn't know why. Not even me. I was screaming and I didn't even know why. I screamed until it hurt. I felt like I had to. No teachers came in to check on us, no matter what they said. We were alone with something. It touched all of us, one by one. I knew my name. None of us said anything. Then Joshua said something. It was unpronounceable. And then he smiled, and recess was over. No kindergartners told their parents what had happened. No one else asked, or if they did, they didn't say. Just me, Tony, Scotty, and Phil knew what Josh and the others had said. School continued like normal. For years. Anticlimactic, right? Nope. I don't think things were actually normal. Because I found something out just three days ago. My mom told me a story about my second grade year that I didn't remember. She said my friends and I had drawn nasty stuff on our teacher's whiteboard. She said we got sent to detention for that. I don't remember that at all. I know what happened. Only one explanation. We didn't draw stuff on the whiteboard. We didn't get sent to detention. We got sent somewhere else. We took a seat in the bad chair. And whatever happened there worked. All my memories of the rest of second grade and third grade and fourth grade cannot be trusted. I returned to Augusta, Georgia to find Warwood. Instead, I found a different school in this place, which for their sake I will not name. The building, though, was same as Warwood. It was refurbished and painted differently. I entered the school and asked the front desk about its history, explaining that I used to attend the school when it was called Warwood. Oh, yes, Warwood. It was renamed after the management change in 04. Management change? Yes, most of the original staff quit or relocated rather abruptly to many different places. DuPont, Fayetteville, D.C., Firebroker, Philly. Hmm, I paused. Was any reconstruction done to the interior? My eyes glanced down the hall where the teacher's lounge had originally been. No, I, I don't think so. Why? I just have some fuzzy memories in one room. I'd like to clear them up. I'm afraid I can't let you into any of the rooms without special permission. That's okay, I, I understand. Would you happen to know if any of the old teachers from Morewood still work here? Just one, I believe. Who? Natasha Tuger. She still teaches kindergarten. Did she teach you? Not me personally, but I do remember her. Would you like to speak with her after school? The day ends in about an hour. Yes, I would appreciate that. Thanks. I took a seat outside the office and browsed on my phone. The woman at the front desk had called Natasha's room and informed her that she had a visitor. What's your name, sir? She asked me. Alex. His name is Alex. He's a former student. Some brief conversation passed, and then she hung up. Natasha remembers you. She's very excited to see you. Good. I smiled. My heart was skipping beats, and I felt nauseous, but I did my best to hide it. I excused myself to the restroom, which was exactly where I remembered it. I recalled the story about dead Steve appearing in this very bathroom, and I knew the teacher's lounge was just a room over. I did my business, and as I washed my hands, a child entered. Hello, said the boy. Hello, said the boy. Uh, hey. I'm good with children. The children I know, that is. At this point, I was afraid of being labeled a pervert and spoke with children in an elementary restroom. However, and 
did my best to avoid saying much of anything. But kids these days can be very social, and this one was. Are you Sunburn's daddy? Nope. Why wasn't this boy even going to the bathroom? He was standing outside the stalls, watching me wash my hands. You look like someone's daddy. Okay. I dried my hands and awkwardly waved goodbye. The boy remained still, staring. As I left the restroom, I looked to my left and saw the door to the lounge. The door had been redone and was far fancier now. It even said teacher's lounge on the window. Very cliché. I casually strolled by and looked inside with my eyes corners. I didn't see anyone. Then I got a bad idea. I decided to test the doorknob. It was unlocked. So I went inside. Bridge, coffee table, sink, staffed restroom, chairs, door. The same door I had seen glimpses of in my time at Warwood. I did a precautionary check behind me, confirming that no teachers were heading inside. Not that I'd be able to avoid them anyhow. Then I returned my attention to the door. It was now or never, I supposed. I approached it with a trembling hand and twisted the doorknob. It creaked open exactly how you'd imagine an old door would. I peered into a dark staircase that descended straight downward. Cold air washed over my face and my head began to throb. I took a step inside and the throbbing grew worse. It did with every step down. There was no light I could see at the bottom, yet I continued with my phone screen as a guide. The pain in my head stretched down to my spine. My body knew I had been here before, and whatever happened wasn't good. As I reached the bottom of the stairwell, I spotted a light switch on the right with my phone. I flicked it on, not knowing what to expect. Boxes. Lots of boxes. And shelves. No bad chair, no candles, no satanic symbols or skeletons or pictures of children. Despite this, my head and back still ached. Welcome back, Alex. Natasha stood on the bottom step, smiling and dressed in a floral gown. I'm leaving. Out of my way. I did not know how threatening I sounded, though I did try. Open up a box, Alex. I said move. I walked forward with fists balled, but she did not care. She did not even look at me. She looked behind me, her grin wider. What the hell did you do to me in here? I had broken. I had given in and asked. She knew I was afraid. She had leverage. Natasha said the same thing that girl in kindergarten class had said. It was beautiful. So beautiful. Then she pointed to the storage boxes. Take a look. No. Yes, I wanted to. Or at least something inside me wanted to. But I refused. Tony, Scott, Phil. They came back too. Shut up. Natasha moved past me, very gently, as though walking on air. I wanted to burst up the stairs, but something held me back. She knelt down by a rather large box to the right of the room and opened it. It had not been sealed. She stuck her entire left arm inside of it and grunted as she lifted an object out. As soon as I saw it, I fell to my knees. I remembered it, just barely. A skull. Not of a human, and of no animal I had ever seen... I was frozen in place. The pain in my body was now so extreme that I wish I had a way to kill myself. Natasha spoke, but it was unpronounceable. Then she placed the skull on top of my head. In my mind, I saw them all. The teachers dressed in black, the candles, the bonds on my wrists and ankles, the robed ones. The way they moved, the way they bent. Their faces distorted beyond imagination. The shaking of the ground beneath me. The freezing blast of wind from somewhere else. Then they all shrieked and bowed. 
In the corner I saw Tony and Phil and Scotty. They were sobbing and vomiting. Their eyes rolled back in their heads. I returned to the moment at hand and watched Natasha die. That demented bald boy with something on him was tearing at her flesh. Dead Steve. My eyes closed and I heard the screams of kindergartners, the prayers of Natasha, the songs of the faculty, the unpronounceable. I remembered. All those days at school after I had taken a seat in the bad chair. My throne. The hours spent being worshipped, the plans, the visions, unpronounceable entering children, entering me. I didn't always work. Dead Steve, J-Boy. But when it did work, it worked well. There's a little piece of something everywhere. He left me for a while, but he's back now. He always comes back. To all of us. There's nothing that can be done about it. Everyone will sit down. Everyone will be someone. Leave Your Flashlights at Home Written by Jeff Harton Performed by Steve Taylor I've been a national park ranger for close to two decades. Protocols have changed a lot in that time. I write this just to try to keep people safe for the next time you venture to the big outdoors. Let me tell you about the last park I worked. I can't be too specific about the location for my job's sake. Anyway, we had clusters of campsites so that we rotated annually. The idea was to prevent one group from getting overused and worn down, let nature regrow a little bit. The winter had just passed, and our big summer season was a few months away. I'm sent out to check the suitability of the campsites to decide which ones need time to recover and which ones we can open up. Winter's here. We're cold. Not too many people camp during the winter, aside from rugged masochists and Boy Scout troops led by people who believe they are rugged masochists. I didn't expect to find much out of the ordinary. The first site was clear and ready to go. As I'm trekking to the next site, I see what looks like some debris and junk down a ways in a river valley. Looks like some jackasses set up an unauthorized camp down there. Usually when that happens, they leave garbage and smoldering fires. This is going to be a pain to clear up. I approach, seeing the telltale wreckage of what must have been one hell of a party. Crap scattered everywhere, skeletons of tents still raised up, and blood... I stop and time stops with me. Pools of blood are spread out along the ground. Next to signs of something heavy being dragged into the brush. I pull my radio off my belt and pause. I then pull my Glock 22 out of my holster and rack one round. I'm a certified law enforcement officer, but I haven't had to use my gun in a long time. I quickly look around for any movement then get on my radio and call in for backup. While I wait, I listen. Silence. Silence in nature isn't good. Prey get quiet when they sense a predator. I hope all the birds are being still on my account. I edge forward slowly, looking for anyone or anything. A shredded plastic cooler, a tent that has been annihilated, with more blood splashed on the walls and inside. And people died here. I know it. You can't lose that much blood and just walk off. But no people. Shreds of clothes and a little viscera drawing all the damn flies here, but no people. I've seen bears rummage through camps and destroy anything that looked edible. There are wild hogs here that cut trails through the deep brush and are even more dangerous than the bears, but this isn't either of them. The devastation here is just too much. Some scourge of God came through here and just ripped everything to pieces. Finally, backup arrives, and I'm sent to report to HQ. 
They even brought medics out here. I don't know why. There's no one here to save. One of the new recruits vomits at the scene. I'm glad to get the hell out of here. I get back and HQ is a buzz. Only four people work there, but calls are ringing, printers printing, and the air feels electrified. The manager sees me and signals me to his office. He's pale, ashen looking, bloodshot eyes. I sit down by his desk and he goes to the door and locks it. I've never seen him lock that door. He asks me what I saw. I tell him, uninterrupted. He looks even paler afterward, and his hands tremble a bit. There's a very long pause, and I expect more questions. He doesn't ask any. I leave, then hear the door locked behind me. After a few minutes, I hear him call someone up, and a long, low conversation ensues. I never see him again. Word comes down from on high. We're assigned a new manager, one who excels at what he calls crises. His first order of business, a controlled burn of the unauthorized camp and the sites closest to it. I'm not arguing. I watch the smoke rise in the distance and pray that's the end of it. New orders. Relocate the existing campsites closer to HQ. Before we do that, we stake out a few trail cameras at the new locations just to make sure it's not in the middle of a nesting ground. We put up a few cameras pointed at the hog trails through the brush for good measure. A couple of days pass, and we go out to collect the footage. The new manager takes it all and starts studying it in his office. A couple of hours into reviewing, he freaks out, starts screaming and yelling, gets on the phone, calling up the line, spitting more obscenities. He spends the rest of the day and that night in the office calling up specialists and planners. Next morning, I show up for a meeting. Manager doesn't look like he slept. Massive changes afoot. He lays out our new plans, including massively bright lampposts circling the park border, as well as floodlights around the ranger station. Campsites need to be moved even closer in, clear lines of sight from the light if possible. I butt in, telling him that defeats the point of going camping. If you're just going on a short walk through the grass, then setting up so close you can see the parking lot. He tells me to shut up that it's just the start. The park now closes at sundown, sharp. Also, we're now required to have a long gun on our person at all times. Now, it isn't uncommon for rangers to carry an AR-15 or a Remington 870 shotgun going out in the deep woods. There are wild and rabid animals out there. The real concern are massive pot growers. These aren't your chill neighbor who hides a few plants behind the tomatoes. They run the spectrum, from large-scale suppliers who like their privacy and dislike law enforcement, to anti-government crazies who think we have no right over them, the true patriots. Both groups have a few common points. They tend to be well-armed, they do not like lawmen, and they won't shy away from taking a pot shot at some dumb poor ranger who finds himself in their fields. Keep in mind, Elliot Ness, Mr. I Fought Al Capone in one, got scared off busting up Appalachian moonshiners because they constantly sniped at him in the foothills. They shoot to kill. Those are the reasons we keep the big guns around, not routine patrols. I drew the short straw and got the overnight shift. Manager tells me more changes to protocol will be listed when I return. Overnights used to be easy. Monitor the radios, bust up the parties if needed, check for poachers if they're operating nearby, make sure the forest doesn't burn down. I clock in and, per instructions, go to the gun cage. My, things have changed. Our shotguns have new rifled barrels so they can handle the solid slugs we've been issued. That's the kind of firepower you want to take down a charging bear. God forbid you ever need it. The AR-15s have been stepped up, too. The old 15-round magazines have been replaced by 30-round ones. Someone even snuck us in hollow-point rounds. Makes no damn sense. Shooting in the woods, you need full metal jacket ammo so the rounds don't go wild when they touch a twig. Hollow-points just exist to do more tissue damage. This is ridiculous. This is overkill. We're not a war zone. We don't need this firepower. Next to the radio, there are new instructions. Now, we're not allowed to directly respond to emergency calls. 
We can reply, figure out what the issue is, then we report to a new phone number I don't recognize. Time passes slowly tonight. I'm not even allowed to leave the building until sunup. A few uneventful nights pass. The new floodlights and lampposts are frying my eyes. It's so bright out there a blind man could see. A week later, some kids roll into the lot. They grab their backpacks and start hiking up the ridge. I know what they're up to. No one has booked a campsite that night. Cheap youngins going on a camp out that'll be a raging party. I wait for the sun to go down, confirming they're not out for a day hike. I call my manager to report. He instructs me to call the new number. I report up to them now. A curt voice answers the phone. He asks my park, then pauses. He asks the issue. Bunch of kids on an unauthorized site. Do I go break it up? I can see their campfire out the ridge right now. No. Do not leave the building. Do not attempt communication. That is all. Report if there are any developments. Right after daybreak, the manager rides up. It's real early. Have you seen them? Did they leave? No. Car's still there. Let them rest. They're probably all hungover. He curses non-stop. He then goes inside to make a call. I'm outside looking up the ridge when he exits the station. One AR-15 in his hand, another one strapped across his back, clock on his hip. He marches single-mindedly toward his car. I try to ask him what in God's name he's doing, but he isn't listening or responding. He takes a jerry can of gasoline from his car and marches up the ridge. I yell after him, to no reply. I consider following him. That doesn't seem like a good idea. I go back inside and call the number. The same curt voice, the same direct questions. Yeah, the manager went up to that campsite, armed to the teeth and carrying gasoline. What the hell do I do? Stay there. Do not interfere. Backup is inbound. Report if there are any developments. About that time, I start to see smoke wafting off the ridge. Two vans ride into the lot at a screaming speed. A dozen men, heavily armed and armored, exit quickly. I go out to check. Hey, who are you guys? What's going on? The men are all lined up with that impeccable military precision. One of them, a commander, I assume, exits the vehicle last. He says, Which direction did he go? I, I mean, he's up there. I point at the increasing smoke. The men fan out and start jogging up the ridge. I hear rifles cocking as they leave. I try to shout after them, but no response. I look at the vans they came in, large, nondescript. They just say DOI response team on the side. Half an hour later, they return, dragging the manager with them. He is bound in zip ties. He screams. I did what needed to be done, trust me. It's worse than they thought. We can't stop this. Burn it all. They throw him in the back and sedate him. Commander approaches me, my neck hairs bristle in cold fear. I need to see the office. All computers and anything with a hard drive is coming with me. He mentioned videotapes. I need those too. I unlock the doors and they ransack the place. Everything gets taken. Printed reports from the last few years disappear into those vans. The videotapes get bagged up and held by the commander himself. He studies the gun cage. Cute. You're out of your league. He scoffs. Finally, they found everything they looked for. The commander tells me, Call the number. Tell him it's contained. You need a new superior. Also, don't talk about this to anyone. They leave, and just on cue, the fire brigade and a few news vans show up. The fire is contained, the news reports say. Rumors of missing campers are unsubstantiated at this time. Still, the rumors alone are enough to scare off this season's campers. A quick change up of managers is chalked up to bureaucracy. The press dies down after a week or two. The new manager is very good at dealing with them. Thankfully, with no new campers and our now even shorter open hours, we can get more work done around here. Rebuilding the station took some time, and we just set up the new campsites. They're practically spitting distance from the station. Nothing dramatic happens for a few days. Then on a whim, the manager tells us to set up some cameras around the station and the campsites. There's usually so much human activity around here, all you see are some raccoons, maybe the rare hungry bear, 
but we humor him and set him up all around. A couple of days pass, we collect the footage. I play poker with one of the rookies while the manager watches hours of footage of an empty but brilliantly illuminated parking lot. Then he gets to the footage around the station. Screams come from the office. We barge in, and he's stamping on the camera hard drives, gibbering things I can't understand along the lines of, Tony was clean, safe, no recent activity. Bullcrap here, I'm not gonna do it. He barks at us to leave. Later, he makes a call. Rookie goes up to the door and listens in. Rookie comes back reporting, yeah, he's demanding a transfer. Says they lied to him. Something about they didn't do their jobs properly. He's not prepared or equipped here. Then I just heard the phone click and some sobbing. Hours later, my manager exits the office. His shoulders are slumped, defeated. We cut our hours even further. Practically open on weekends only. We'll have a full staff ready those days, but a skeleton crew the rest of the time campers are required to check in to one of the closest sites. No campsite, and they're told to leave. We are not authorized to leave the station after dark under any circumstances. In an emergency, do not call 911, call the number, and do exactly what they say. We draw straws for who gets overnight shifts. Why we need to stay overnight if we can't do anything is beyond me. I asked the manager about it, and he just said, it's standard protocol is to have someone on hand to report any irregularities overnight. I have to work my overnight shift. I keep my phone close, the number dialed in, ready if I need to call. It is a bad night. I just wind up pacing around with my shotgun, glancing into the bright floodlights, trying to see what's past them. I hear crickets, and it relaxes me. Prey is quiet when predators are around. It was a long night. The next night, my manager draws the short straw. He seems resigned. In the end, we all have to take a turn. He brings the brightest damn tactical flashlight I've ever seen. Said he bought it just because he's afraid of the dark. He isn't really. He's afraid of the things in the dark. I get a phone call at 3 a.m. It's him. Get over here now and bring guns! What? You have a damn arsenal! Now! Oh, I swear to God, I screwed up. Oh, man, I think they're attracted to the light. I called that number, and all they said was back up and be here in the morning. Oh, damn, damn, damn. I hear the piercing staccato of gunshots. Pause. More gunshots. Screaming. Scuffling. The line goes dead. I call the number. A new, terse voice answers. Look, I work at Park. I just got off the phone with I just spoke with What can you report? Something bad's happened. I'm serious. I heard gunshots. We will have back up there as soon as possible. Did he say anything else? Yeah, he said he thought they were attracted to the light. Doesn't make sense to me. Interesting. Thank you for your report. Park is now closed. You will be reassigned. Goodbye. Officially, the park was closed to be scheduled for a controlled burn. Let the old trees die and make room for new ones. There was nothing in the official report about what happened to the manager on duty. The public understanding was bureaucracies need to be shaken up on occasion. No one asked any more questions. I get transferred to a new park halfway across the country. Change of scenery and beautiful. I get some odd rules here, too. Don't go far after dark. And don't carry a flashlight. I'm concerned about why. Why can't you use a flashlight at night when you need one? They won't tell me. Be safe, everyone. What Hurricane Sandy Uncovered Written by Victor King Performed by Jason Hill It was 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit the Northeast United States. New York City was fixated on a dangling crane in midtown Manhattan. Elsewhere on the coast, weird stories and photos circulated in the internet and social media. Most notably, a picture of a shark on the flooded front lawn of a New Jersey home. One of the more disturbing pictures I saw 
was that of a casket floating down an empty street. I've searched high and low for a copy of that photo, just to prove my story really, but I haven't found it since. Caskets floating away during a flood aren't a new thing, believe it or not. In New Orleans, the problem of airtight coffins popping out of the ground because of heavy rainfall became so bad, well, most graves are now either lined with concrete or they just build them above ground. Before Sandy, this phenomenon was unheard of in the state of Connecticut. I never saw it personally, mind you. I just saw the picture I mentioned in a few stories from patrons at the bar I used to work at. Problem with that is, drunks aren't exactly known for their honest storytelling, of course. But this story, the story I'm telling you, this story took place the day after the hurricane. The bar I work at is located on the outskirts of Waterbury, Connecticut. My boss called me and asked me if I could go check out the place and make sure it hadn't been damaged or looted. I said I would on the condition that I could drink for free when I got there. He agreed, not having much choice in being flooded in and all, and I was in my truck and on my way, figuring I'd spend my afternoon relaxing in an empty bar. There's something inherently creepy about a city the day after a storm. Major roadways are abandoned. Street lights are out. One major intersection I had to go through simply had a stop sign stuck in a Home Depot bucket in the middle of the road instead of the usual working stoplights. The power was out, so most of the houses I passed were pitch black. Pure silence hung over everything with the exception of my truck's engine and the country station I was listening to. Only one word came to mind at that moment. Apocalyptic. I pulled into the strip mall where the bar was located. I locked up and moved towards the glass front door. The neon sign outside had been broken in the storm. McKinley's Gin Mill was written in hunter green gothic type on yellowing plastic. The break in the sign was in the top left corner where an Irish caricature grinned over a mug of beer. With the top left part of his head missing, a single remaining eye made his smile seem more sinister than sarcastic. I opened up and I flipped the switch. The light stayed off. Power's out, signs broken but I couldn't see any other damage. I grabbed a green Jameson bottle along with my portable iPod player, kept under the bar, and made my way into the adjourning room. The way McKinley's was set up was as soon as you walk through the front door, you're in the bar room. The room had wood paneling and was decorated with photos, posters, signs, and scattered on the walls. Across from the bar was a five-foot gap in the wall that led to an area with a big-screen TV, pool table, and a jukebox. I put the bottle on one of the tables and set up my iPod. I enjoy solitude for the most part, and the idea of drinking a bottle of Irish and listening to music while casually improving my pool game was welcome compared to how I usually spend my nights. Noisy 20-somethings taking Instagram pics and comparing how drunk they are, well, I just put my chill-out playlist on and set up the table. I was maybe halfway through my second game when I heard the bell over the front door tingle. I put down the pool cue to the sound of a scraping stool. I walked back into the ballroom and saw the man's back. You got a drink there, friend? He asked in a sing-song voice. I made my way to the shelf with all the liquor bottles. The man was dressed odd compared to our usual clientele. He was wearing a dark black suit, like the guy had just gotten out of church or something. What's your poison? I asked. He wrapped his knuckles on the wood. Four roses bourbon, if he'd be so kind. Three fingers neat, 
if you don't mind. I reached up to the top of the shelf and grabbed the dust-covered bottle. I took clean rocks glass from the bottom of the shelf before turning towards the man and pouring the drink. The man grabbed the glass and I looked up at him. That was the first time I got a real look at him. His suit wasn't Sunday best, as I had originally thought. Patches of it had rotted away. It was covered in patches of mud and dirt and pus yellow stains that shone past the black. The shirt underneath, which had once been white, was now a light brown, and the same sickly yellow blotches scattered about. But that wasn't the horrifying part. His eyes were glazed over white, with only evidence of pupils being putrid milk-colored dots. His skin was pulled tight against his skull like pale cling film. The right side of his face didn't even have that much. The bottom of his right eyeball was visible past a half-rotten eyelid. Cheekbone, jaw, teeth were all visible in a deep yellow color. He sipped the whiskey and brown liquor ran through the gaps in his teeth. <sighs> It burns. Very fine, friend. Very fine. Damn good stuff. He said with a half grin. I pulled back and the man gave a deep laugh. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I must look a mess. Caught me reflection in a store window. Don't you worry. Don't mean you any kind of harm. Not to you, at least. I reached under the bar, my hand wrapped around a sawn-off baseball bat we kept in case of a robbery. If you're aiming to use that bat, you'd better make sure your first hit is true, friend. I don't want to hurt you, but I will. How did he know what I was thinking? Did he check under the bar when he walked in? Did he see the reflection in the mirror? But he answered for me. So when you're dead, gone on 60 years, you start to see things no one else does, he said, pointing at his half-exposed eye. The eye sees all, I'm afraid. I see your heart racing. I see your knuckles whitening on that bat. I see you, Frank. My fingers tightened around the leather grip. He took another sip. I don't know how I know either, but please, friend, put the bat down. I just got out and I just like a bit of friendly conversation. Grab a drink, pal. My dime. I let go of the bat and tried to feel the shelf behind me. I half swung my hand around until I felt fingers touch glass. I put another rock's glass on the bar top in front of me, not wanting to lose sight of the stranger. When a man with half a face, who knows your first name, asks to have a drink with you, you have three choices. Option A, try to kill him. Well, that wasn't a choice if he knew what I was thinking before I thought it. Option B is to scream and run. But run where? The police? Oh, I'm sorry, officer, but can I trouble you to take care of this zombie in my bar? Oh, yes, I've been drinking. Why do you ask? Option C. Have a drink. Hope for the best. I poured myself a bourbon, trying to avoid staring at his face. Oh, you go ahead and look. The man said. And before you ask, I don't know I am here. Well, not here, here. I'm here, here to have a drink and some conversation. Here, though, well, there's a mystery. I woke up staring at silk. Clawed at it, I did. Scream. Screamed I did, and I don't know for how long. 
Could have been a day, could have been 60 years. Didn't exactly have a calendar down there. All I know is the box I was in started to move. The wood was old enough that after a few hits I cracked it. Ripped apart the top of me coffin and made me way up here. You can imagine it's been quite an interesting day for me, friend. <laughs> he chuckled. And I drank deep and poured myself another. By the by, is East Windsor Road still three blocks down? He asked. We... Uh, he, uh, no, it... Three blocks down is, um, uh, uh K Kennedy Street, I responded. He looked confused. Kennedy Street, eh? And who's Kennedy? I'm talking three blocks that way, he said while pointing behind himself with his thumb. Um, yeah, that's Kennedy Street. Uh, and that's Kennedy. I said while nodding towards a black and white photo of JFK we had hung on the wall by the mirror. Kennedy, eh? Hmm. And uh, what did he do to earn a place in that fine wall? I responded to the 60-year-old dead man the same way I would a drunk patron. He was the first Irish Catholic president. The man laughed. <laughs> Irish Catholic president. <laughs> Irish Catholic. Oh, by God. I would have loved to have seen that. Oh, oh what is? First woman president. <laughs> the first black president. <laughs> the first atheist. <laughs> I stared at him a moment. I hope he's not a racist. No, we, we have a black president now. President Barack Obama? He laughed so hard he almost fell out of his chair. <laughs> oh! 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 Oh my god, friend. <laughs> oh, that's rich. A black man as a president. <laughs> what a time! <laughs> Oh, God. I've missed so much. He wrapped his fingers in the bar. Tell me, Frank, do you believe in fate, my friend? I shook my head. Well, I do, he responded. At least, I do now. Sixty years on Earth. Only me to keep me company. And I know why, too. My pretty wife. Well, I guess pretty ex-wife now. She killed me. <laughs> he shook his head. I knew that stew tasted funny. <laughs> Anyways, my wife wanted to be with my friend Teddy. And I knew at the time that they were running around together. One night I go home and eat a nice home-cooked meal. Next thing I know, I'm clawing at the ceiling. <laughs> he finished his bourbon. Dark brown trails on yellowed bone through gritted teeth. I'll have my revenge, though. Seeing as I'm gonna walk down... <laughs> Kennedy Street. Go right up to my old house and knock on the door and yell... Honey, I'm home. <laughs> and then when I see her face, well, she won't be so pretty anymore. And I do so hope Teddy will be there too. Oh, that would be a proper homecoming. By God. He stood up. I pay you back, friend, when I get the chance. I seem to be a bit light at the moment. I'm sure you understand. Sir Lancia. Frank. 
he turned around and walked out the door. As the bell above the door tingled, I fell to the ground, trembling. I had finally composed myself a few hours later in the mid-afternoon. I locked up, texted my boss about the damage, and went home. I didn't sleep much. I ended up calling out of work the next few days. But with a combination of sleep deprivation and just repeating to myself that it was a bad Halloween prank, I finally found the courage to go back. Then, a week after my return, I was opening up when I found an envelope shoved under the door. Inside was a newspaper clipping about an elderly couple who seems to have been ripped apart by some animal. Also, nine dollars. Once I found out from the owner a glass of four roses cost three when they first opened in 1951. I quit, and I left the state of Connecticut for good. For a long time, debate raged over whether or not there existed such a thing as a soul. Science nearly discredited the entire idea, but then came the breakthrough. The soul became an accepted fact of human existence, as widely believed in as the existence of the stomach. Of course, there's a big difference between knowing and understanding. In the case of souls, current technology is incapable of studying them without killing the subject. After death, the soul vanishes, so we know they exist, but we know nothing about them. Until now. I've developed a containment device that I am certain can hold the soul in place long enough for me to make a few observations. As for the subject, I've procured a death row inmate. His involvement in my experiment postponed the end of his life by several weeks, so he was happy to participate. The test begins in an hour. I expect it to last another hour at most. I shall report my findings when it's complete. I can't believe what I've accomplished. I can't believe the experiment is still ongoing. My containment device worked better than I ever thought possible. Souls have always vanished at the moment of, or moments after, death. My device is based on readings taken during those times, and it attempts to block whatever forces causes the disappearance. It was only supposed to maintain the status quo of the immediate moment of death for a short time. Long enough, I hoped, for some new discoveries, but never this long. It has been five hours since the experiment started, and the soul of Bruce Merrick is still contained. I only left the testing chamber because I can't stay awake any longer, and I needed to make this record while it was all still fresh in my mind. Here's what happened. First, I rendered the subject unconscious to ensure a painless death. The actual method of execution I chose was decapitation for its swiftness and certainty. Bruce was restrained within the containment device and decapitated via a remote-controlled guillotine. The containment device was activated just prior to the guillotine. Souls are, of course, invisible but my instruments were able to detect its presence immediately. It occurred to me as I wrote this that my instruments could be faulty. Before I go any further, I should run a diagnostic. The diagnostic is complete. My instruments are operating flawlessly. Bruce Merrick, or at least his soul, is still contained within the chamber. Furthermore, I've observed a strange phenomenon. The containment area is filled with a very thin mist. I almost overlooked it as I ran the diagnostic, but it's there. I wonder if it's an effect of the containment field on the soul, or if this is how a soul behaves when trapped in one place for an extended period of time. It's late, so I'll sleep on it. In the meantime, 
I've set up every recording device I have to monitor the testing chamber. I rushed to the testing chamber first thing this morning, and my findings are fascinating. The mist is still present, thicker than last night, but also clinging more to the floor rather than filling the entire space. The floor also appears damp. Bruce's body still lies in its restraints, his head staring at me from the tub it landed in. I really want to remove his corpse, but there's no way to do that without disturbing the experiment. Reviewing the video footage from last night, sped up of course, the thickening and sinking of the mist is apparent. There was nothing in the audio aside from the expected background of my machinery. I've spent the morning in observation, and it is now 12.30. I still can't believe how effective my containment device is. The subject has endured for 16 hours now, far beyond my initial estimate. Interestingly, the signals coming from the soul have gotten stronger. This is why I believe the mist and moisture is in fact the soul manifesting itself. I still don't know why it's becoming visible, and I probably won't have an answer until the experiment is concluded. When I left for lunch, the mist had become so thick that the floor was entirely obscured. It is pure white and about four inches deep. After lunch, I noticed that the mist no longer filled the entire floor. The edges of the containment field are bare once more. My instruments are no longer useful because the signals coming off the soul are now too strong for them to register. They simply were never designed for something this clear and powerful. I noticed that the bare floor, which earlier I described as damp, seems perfectly dry. I think I will try to recalibrate some spare equipment to handle the stronger signals coming out of the chamber. It has now been nearly 24 hours since the start of the experiment, and there is a new development. The mist has continued to coalesce and shrink. At the center, there is what appears to be a solid mass. It's just a shallow dome of white poking above the rest of the mist. My recalibrated instruments have kept up with the ever-increasing levels, but I may have to make more adjustments tomorrow. The mist was all gone this morning. I was alarmed at first, although the containment field still seemed to be working. All I saw in the chamber was Bruce's corpse. The floor was completely bare, save for a few dark brown flecks of blood that the tub failed to catch. Then I saw, in one corner of the chamber, a small puddle of white liquid. Rising out of it was a lump of white larger than the one I observed last night, but otherwise the same. Now and then, it seemed to throb or shift. At the moment, I'm unsure if this amorphous mass is in fact solid. The only way to find out would be to enter the chamber, and I cannot do that for reasons stated earlier. My containment device was never meant to run for this long, and I wonder if such an extended test is taking its toll on the equipment. There seems to be a... well, I can only describe it as a change in the air. I feel it every time I enter the lab. I should check on the machinery again and make sure the containment field isn't about to explode. The machinery is working fine. Perhaps the energized feeling is just my own excitement. I haven't gone into the lab all evening. I just didn't feel like it, I guess. Instead, I reviewed the video footage from the past 24 hours. It's fascinating to watch the mist develop. It first appeared a couple hours after the subject's death. There was no concrete source. It simply faded into existence, filling the entire chamber right from the beginning. Seeing this time-lapse version of events... It is clear that the mist is condensing. It's like watching steam turn to water, then ice. Every time I reach the end of the recording, I pause and stare at the blob. Something about it. As I was writing this, I glanced at the video one more time. 
I thought I saw an anomaly just before the recording stopped. I, I hesitated to write it down. I only caught it out of the corner of my eye, and it is late. I'll review the footage again in the morning when I'm not so sleep-deprived. The anomaly was nothing. I made myself go to the lab this morning. The blob has grown. It sits in the center of the chamber, about a half meter tall, during the apex of one of its throbs. I can't be certain of this, but there may be a translucent film acting as a skin. I'm afraid that's all I noted before lunch. I was eager to get out of there. I think it's the sight of Bruce's head lying in the tub and the memory of that anomaly last night, which turned out to be nothing. I didn't go into the lab at all today. I'm not feeling well. I was able to monitor the live video footage from today. The blob has begun moving around the chamber. I think it accomplishes this in a manner similar to a slug. Its progress is very slow. It seems to be moving in the direction of Bruce's body. A thought just just occurred to me. If this blob is the soul, it is, in fact... I must test this theory immediately. I don't feel well enough to write anything down. Check the audio recording for the results of my experiment. Haven't been back to the lab for two days. Irresponsible of me. Fortunately, I finally returned today to find everything still in working order. I deleted the audio recording from my last experiment. I was out of sorts, not in my right mind. No doubt, I corrupted the results. The evidence was worthless, so I got rid of it. I arrived at the testing chamber to find the blob sitting on top of the subject's head. It hadn't grown much since I last saw it, but its shape was altered slightly. Where before it was mostly a round lump, it now has a contour, vaguely suggesting pseudopods. It appeared to use these to prod the subject, especially in the region of the eyes. I received a very disturbing phone call this morning. Thank goodness for computers. I doubt my handwriting would be legible now. The short version is this. Bruce Merrick was innocent. Some new evidence turned up, and while Bruce certainly wasn't a clean, law-abiding citizen, he was not the murderer who he thought he was. He definitely did not belong on death row. I keep telling myself if it's too late. No amount of regret will change that. Had I not pulled Bruce into this experiment, he would have been executed by the state even sooner. The best I can do is carry on with my work so his death won't have been for nothing. I went into the lab tonight, but I wish I hadn't. I'm not sure which is more disturbing, the phone call this morning, or the image that met me in the containment chamber. Bruce's body was gone. His head was still there, but not in the tub. It was placed on the floor close to the glass. The eyes were missing. As for the blob, it was on the far side of the containment field, much larger than it had been before. The thing seems to sense my approach. It turned, or rather twisted, to look at me. As it did, its shapeless form took on shape. No, the suggestion of a shape. Never before had it looked so human. I could now make out a distorted, underdeveloped head, neck, torso. The limbs were as yet amorphous stubs, but it was close enough that I shuddered just recalling it. The energized feeling I mentioned earlier, it had come back with a vengeance when that thing looked at me. I'm convinced now that it isn't radiation off the machines, but something more primal from within. I was afraid. Perhaps before I was overcome with excitement, but today's revelations have quenched my eagerness. Tonight, I was inexplicably afraid. I can't sleep, so I'm recording my thoughts. 
The one thing that has always held back mankind's study of the soul is that it requires killing the test subject. This didn't bother me because I was experimenting on a man already sentenced to death. But now it turns out I wasn't. If that thing is truly Bruce's soul, why did I delete that audio recording from the other night? On a whim, I decided to check the video stream coming from the containment chamber in the lab. Probably won't do anything to help me sleep, but... What is it doing? What is it doing? The blob? Soul? Whatever. It's staring right at the camera. I know it's looking because it has eyes now. Not eyes like iris and pupils. Eyes like indentations in its face. Like someone used a golf ball to poke holes in it. I just put in my headphones to see if there was any audio coming through. There is something, but I can't make it out. It's a deep sound, throbbing. I have to stop doing this to myself. If I don't get sleep, all my observations will be unreliable. I've tried to remember the contents of that deleted audio recording. Keep in mind this is a highly unreliable record and shouldn't be seriously considered. Are you Bruce Merrick? Are you Bruce Merrick? Note, my instruments recorded a spike in energy coming from the containment field. Are you Bruce Merrick? If you are not Bruce Merrick, say so now. I take your silence to mean that you are indeed Bruce Merrick. Do you know where you are? Do you know what you are? Is that you attempting to speak? I cannot understand you. Bruce, do you know that you are dead? Please, repeat that. The sounds that seemed to respond to my questions were deep and muted. I believed at the time that I was creating voices out of the ambient hum of machinery. That's why I wrote it off and deleted the recording. After hearing what I did last night, however... I'm not so sure. I feel I should try another questioning session. My visits to the lab have grown so infrequent, it seems like a foreign place to me now. The thing was sitting in the center of the chamber when I arrived. It seems to have stopped growing, instead only refining its shape. Refining, but toward what, I can't tell. It's like its goal is human, but its aim is terrible. The audio record has the full session, but I'll mention a few details here. I began by asking if the thing was Bruce Merrick. What it did in response made my skin crawl. It performed that same twisting motion I've described before. Then its face began pulling apart. Little holes grew into big holes that merged together until there was a limpless mouth speaking to me. The words were completely unintelligible, but there was meaning in those formless syllables. Meaning I can only guess at, but meaning all the same. I ended the session abruptly, when I noticed that the thing was inching closer to the glass that separated us. I don't know what I'm afraid of. The glass is bulletproof, and the thing has exhibited no signs of strength. Except... But that's just conjecture... There is no video record of what happened back then due to an equipment failure. Just conjecture. But what else could have happened to Bruce's body? Another sleepless night, so I'm again watching the live video stream from the lab. As before, the thing is staring at the camera. Its mouth is moving, but I can't pick up any audio. There's something new as well. 
Inside the mouth, I think I can make out teeth. Not human teeth. These make me think of a deep sea fish more than anything else. Needles. Bruce's fate troubles me. He was innocent of murder, according to the court. But he wasn't a good man, either. Strange as it sounds, I think I'd feel better if he'd been a model citizen falsely condemned. I feel like he'd be more likely to forgive. There I go, imparting meaning to things that may be nothing. Strange anomaly in the lab today, as I was checking readings, I noticed that the thing in the chamber was always facing me. What makes it so strange is that it wasn't turning to face me. It just always was. Like... Like my brain had invented this image of it looking at me and was projecting it in front of me so that no matter where I was, it always appeared from the same perspective. Even if it's just barely visible on the edge of my peripheral vision, it is clear as day staring at me with its distorted face. I checked the audio recording a second time just to make sure there hadn't been any sound last night. I guess there must have been something wrong with the stream because I was able to find something. The clearest audio recording I've gotten so far. Liar. I think I'm ready to end this experiment. It has played on my nerves too much and I've already gathered more data than anyone before me. I will shut down the containment field, releasing the soul to wherever it goes after death. I suspect it will simply dissipate in a manner similar to its coalescence, and that'll be the end of it. I shut down the containment field at one this afternoon. At eight, I returned to collect some things and shut down the lab entirely. It was still there. The first thing I did was check to make sure the containment device was indeed deactivated. It was. Next, I ran to the door of the chamber to make sure it was locked. Again, it was. I don't understand. It required so much power to trap a soul after death, to prevent it from vanishing into the unknown. Why now does it remain with nothing to hold it in place? Could it be such prolonged exposure to the containment field altered it somehow? Or perhaps the field only gave it enough time to grow and strengthen so that it could remain under its own power. It's pacing the chamber now, but its face is always looking at me. The same anomaly mentioned before. What it's doing now? It's trying the door. What should I do? Can I keep it locked in there indefinitely? I certainly can't let it out. It's banging on the glass now, banging, but not making any sound. I'm glad ghost stories are just that, stories. Otherwise, I could expect it to just walk through the wall at any moment. He told me I'd live if I helped him. He said I'd be pardoned. I didn't want to die. He lied. Now... I'm dead. He lied. He lied. A Truck Stop Horror by Joshua L. Hood. Narrated by Peter Bishop. Featuring Jesse Cornett, Brendan Hulbert, Rebecca Peason, Sariana Gregg, Otis Jiry, Jonathan Jones, Steve Taylor, Andrea Rose, and Joseph Gable. Original score, production and sound design by Jesse Cornett. An island of light floated in the distance, straight ahead and just off to the right. 
It flickered behind the trees, then sank below an invisible ridge as the LeBaron rattled down the hill in the dark. A single headlight stabbed into the night through ancient pines ahead of it. Paul eased off the gas a touch and let gravity do its part. On the last hill, he felt the splutter and lurch of a thirsty gas tank. He didn't know how many hills the car had left in it. The light island was glowing closer. Paul might make it yet. With a triumphant splutter and pop, the LeBaron rolled past the fuel pumps and into a parking spot at the edge of the lot. Paul had $8 in his pocket and didn't want to spend it all refueling the clunker before he got some coffee to refuel himself. Since the next town was over 80 miles away, he was aware that he might have to skip paying for gas altogether, which would be easier if he waited to fuel up until after he ate. It all depended on the price of coffee and some pecan pie. Gas was 92 cents a gallon here. It was always more expensive at these backwards truck stops, and so was the coffee. Eight bucks doesn't go as far as it used to, he lamented. Stepping out of the car, he felt like he was indeed on a floating island in the center of a black sea. The world beyond the orange floodlights had blinked into darkness when he pulled into the parking lot. Paul liked that. It made him feel safer when the unknown possibilities of the world were at bay. A smaller world was easier to handle, and from the island of light, the only sign of the feral wilderness surrounding him was the smell of trees and the creak of wood swaying in the breeze. Inside the cafe, everyone had been staring out the windows. They all jumped when the bell door cheerily announced Paul's entrance. Then they were all staring at him. Paul had been too self-absorbed to even notice the other cars in the parking lot. But there were half a dozen people inhabiting the single strip of vinyl booths. He stopped short, noting the quizzically horrified looks on their faces. He wondered briefly if he'd remember to zip his fly. But, uh, di didn't you see? Stuttered one man, a baseball cap trucker, who looked like he should have had better command of his senses than he did. Didn't you see? He pointed out the window, and Paul realized that there was more confusion in his voice than fear. But only barely. Paul didn't look out into the parking lot where the man pointed. Most of the others had gone back to staring. But Paul was always a little paranoid of turning his back to a crowd, even a small one. I should call the police, said the waitress behind the counter. Yeah, I'm calling the police. Yeah, replied a large, greasy aproned man, the only one who still hadn't looked away from Paul. Paul turned his back to the door to make as smooth an exit as possible. He didn't know if he had any warrants, but he never liked the sound of police. Don't, the greasy apron said. Paul stopped. Look. He pointed out the window. Paul finally looked, cautiously, one hand still on the door. At first there was nothing. Dark night, glowing lights, dull grey concrete. Between the pumps, Greasy Apron said, and then Paul saw it. At first it was too obvious to be what it was. Then it became too obvious to be anything else. Like the human brain just has a way of knowing some things. It was all black except for a white hand sticking out at an odd angle. The crumpled heap of a human corpse lay smack in the center of the parking lot. Well, shit! Paul muttered, then asked in a shaky voice, What's that about? A pink sweated woman in a booth with a dopey looking boyfriend answered, I don't know. I, I swear we were out there just five minutes ago and there was nothing. No one out there. Yeah, said Dopey Boyfriend. We filled up at pump three. Uh, there was nothing. Paul looked at their table. No food, but opened menus. They clearly hadn't been there much longer than he had. Sh should we go help? Asked the pink sweated woman. Probably, said Greasy Apron, but he didn't move to volunteer. A scraggly man shifted uncomfortably. Don't bother with it. The guy's dead, trust me. I know dead, and that's dead. He was wearing old army greens and had hair almost as greasy as the other guy's apron. Paul was too young for the draft, but he knew a Nam vet when he saw one. He didn't doubt the guy for a moment. 
The waitress's voice broke through the brief silence. They're on their way. A phone clicked as she hung it back on the wall. The police said to stay inside. That could be a while, said Greasy Apron. We're a long ways out. Well, Paul said, not to sound crass, but I'd wait a lot better with coffee and a slice of pecan- The tapes! shouted the waitress, a trace of hope in her voice. Oh yeah, said Greasy Apron. What tapes? asked Pink Sweater. The waitress went bustling toward the kitchen. We just installed cameras, the security kind. We got one for each pump. So if someone tries to pump and dash, we get their license plate and the cops can catch them. Greasy Apron finished for her. Paul was suddenly very aware that he might have to skip the pie. All right, let's get a look at him then, said Dopey Boyfriend, still staring at the corpse in the lot. The trucker broke in. Well, I don't feel like I'm really a part of this. He stood up and walked toward the door. Paul took his hand off the push bar and stepped slightly aside. Now hold on there, said Greasy Apron. You just wait a minute. I ain't got to wait for nothing. I got my gas, money for the burger on the table. You can't stop me. Fear rose in his voice. I ain't gonna stop you, said Greasy Apron. But I'd like to point out that ten minutes ago there wasn't a dead guy lying thirty feet away from that front door. And now there is. And it's sure as shit that guy didn't walk here on his own. Now what are you saying? You saying I had something to do with this? The trucker raised his voice. Now how would I be saying that? Calm down, fella. Don't think about it. You didn't do it. None of us did it. But someone did it. And they're no further than ten minutes away in any direction. You really want to be going out there now? The trucker slowed his pace and stopped right in front of the door. He peered out into the darkness beyond the shores of the island and said nothing. Paul took a couple of steps back from the door. The corpse loomed. Besides, yelled Waitress from the kitchen, ain't you got no sense of mystery? Don't you want to see who done it? She sounded almost excited. Got it rewound. Come back here and look. Whether she was just talking to her co-worker in the greasy apron, or if she meant everybody, they all shuffled back into the kitchen and huddled around a back desk, propped up on one side by a safe and piled with old receipts. Above it hung a black and white TV mounted to the wall. Each corner of the TV showed a different gas pump in grainy shades of gray. Where the four points met in the middle was a slightly misaligned black lump. The pictures disappeared with a click and were replaced with a single, blown-up version of pump number three. There was no body. The time code read 20 minutes earlier. Ghosts of screen burn still crisscrossed the image, adding to the poor resolution. Paul doubted that anyone was in danger of getting their plate number read by this cheap system, at least after dark. The waitress clicked a button on the VCR and the image warbled forward until the shape of an Oldsmobile pulled up to the pump. It was 12 minutes earlier. That's our car, said Pink Sweater. There I am, heading inside to get a table, she narrated. And there's Ducky getting gas. The waitress clicked fast forward again. The dopey boyfriend, Ducky, tapped his toe rapidly, then jumped back into his car in a big old hurry. Stop there, Pink Sweater said. The image clicked back to normal speed. Just as the back corner of Dougie's olds winked out of view, a shadowed shape could be seen at the corner of the screen. It was at the very top of the display, blurry, indistinct, but as the tape rolled forward, it was clear that the shape was loping, like a foot rising and falling out of view. Everyone was holding their breaths. The foot moved across the top of the screen, stopped at the opposite corner, shuffled around a little, flopped a silent but heavy object down onto the pavement, then walked slowly back the way it had come. The image went still, empty except for that one dark shape at the corner. No one spoke for a moment. Another angle, Jesus. Greasy Apron said suddenly. Everybody jumped. <laughs> Sorry, but let's try another angle. Try, try camera four. It shows some of the entrance and more of the parking lot. The waitress hesitated, then pushed eject. The tape from camera four was pushed heavily into the slot and it whirred backwards. 
she stopped it and the screen popped into view. From the new angle, the body would be at the bottom right corner of the screen. In the top left was the entrance into the parking lot, the shore of the island. Suddenly, Paul felt less secure in this isolated little world. This time, she fast-forwarded the image to just where Dougie started driving away from pump three. Then, instead of hitting play, the waitress hit stop. Everyone looked at her. She took a big breath and, almost enthusiastically, hit the play button. All eyes snapped to the screen. A dark shape emerged. It was much bigger from this angle, everything visible but its feet. The shape was that of a man, but not quite. It had the body hefted over the shoulder closest to the camera so that only the limp corpse could be seen above its waist. It walked heavily. The color of its clothes couldn't be made out, and though no one said it, it was because they all knew that its clothes were actually some sort of matted and tangled fur. And it was tall. Impossible to tell exactly how tall, but tall. Behind the lump of a corpse, a long arm swung down in a far more exaggerated way than necessary for its pace. Distended fingers, maybe sharp at the ends, clenched and unclenched into a fist as though it was working out its tensions on an invisible stress ball. It stopped. The body swung left, then right, rocking almost rhythmically. Was it looking for someone? Making sure it was unseen? Impossible to tell. With an ungraceful and soundless thud, it dropped the body onto the ground and turned back the way it had come. That's when everyone saw its face. Resolution was poor, but it looked black-eyed and thick-jawed. Its sneer flickered on the little screen. Its neck was thick and its jaw stretched to an underbite. It scowled, or at least looked like it scowled under its heavy brow. The people in the diner watched until it left the screen. But this time, they didn't start breathing again for a long time, and no one stopped the feed. A new feeling settled over the diner, a new fear. Seconds later, a single headlight pierced through the darkness on the top of the screen. Paul's LeBaron zipped by a corner of the view and quickly arced around to a stop just off the screen. The display dimmed as his brake light shut off, and all was still again. Paul groaned almost whimpered. You parked right by it, by where it went, Pink Sweater said. Paul remained quiet, but he could feel himself beginning to tremble. Y you see that? You parked right by it where it walked off screen. I mean, it couldn't have been a dozen yards away, just like right there. Hey, did you see that? He knows, Greasy Apron said. No one went back to the dining room. Greasy Apron discreetly slipped a butcher knife into the stained pouch of his apron. The waitress suddenly lost her sense of excitement. Paul put his back to the wall of the walk-in freezer and closed his eyes. Son of a bitch. The flickering sneer of the thing outside flashed across his vision and he snapped his eyes back open. How close had it been? Three metallic clicks drew everyone's attention to where the vet stood. His right pant cuff was now hitched above his boot, and a snub-nosed revolver glinted in his hand. More clicks sounded as he rotated the cylinder, eyeing the contents. Paul didn't feel any better, but he didn't feel any worse either. I'll go take a look, the vet said. He'd lost the spacey, burned-out look he'd worn moments before. He seemed almost totally in control of himself, except that his unarmed hand trembled. I don't know if that's such a good idea, Greasy Apron said. Just out to the dining room. We should lock the door if nothing else, replied the vet. Door? Said the waitress. That door is single pane glass. If that thing from the video wanted in, it wouldn't even be slowed down by locking the damn door. Paul noted how she'd said thing from the video, as though it wasn't a real thing that existed just outside the flimsy walls of this isolated truck stop. He couldn't begrudge her a bitter denial. Well, it couldn't hurt, the vet said. He slipped a dented flask from inside his army greens and took a long draw. 
the acrid scent of whiskey drifted past the congealed fat and dish soap smell of the kitchen. The vet swallowed and sighed, but his hand didn't stop shaking. And now Paul saw that his gun hand was twitching as well. Maybe we should just wait here for the cops, Paul said. The vet looked down at his hands and back at Paul. He'd noticed him staring. Ah, this ain't nothing. Just give the old magic some time to kick in. I'll be steady as a rock. He patted his coat, a semi-hollow thunk sounding from the flask inside. Paul shrugged. Seconds later, holding the revolver like a cop in Dragnet, the vet crept out to the dining room where they'd all just been sitting. A short silence ensued before his green-coated form crossed in front of the serving window. Hanging receipts fluttered as he passed. He rounded the counter and went up to the windows, crossing toward the door. Another short silence. Then a loud sound startled everyone. Paul thought it was a gunshot at first, but it wasn't that. Too metallic. It's all right, it's all right, it's... Greasy Apron whispered. Just the door latch. I've been... I've been meaning to get some graphite in it. Shh! The waitress hushed. Everyone fell silent again. The green coat crossed back in front of the window, but then stopped. He jolted around and everyone heard a gasp. They tensed. Holy shit! The vet said, half whispering. Get out here! Everyone, get out here! They didn't pause. Something in his voice overrode their fear of being seen by the thing outside the window. In a disordered herd, they bustled out into the dining room, looking around themselves like they'd never seen the place before. The vet was staring out the window, pointing his gun languidly towards the gas pumps, clearly not intending to fire. Paul squinted against the reflected light, then saw what had caught his attention. The corpse had moved. The video! The waitress said to herself as she trotted back to the camera display. No one else followed her, but waited and stared. Two of the videos had been ejected, but two others were still recording. A moment passed. And she said, My God, he's alive! Impossible, the trucker said. You said he was dead. The vet didn't look away. I just didn't want anyone to do anything stupid. You mean, you knew he was still alive? Pink Sweater gasped. I didn't know nothing, but I suspected something was off. And I was right, saw this back in the war. You injure a soldier just enough to make his compadres want to go out and rescue him, and then blam! Greasy Apron looked at the vet aghast and somewhat disgusted. The fuck you thinking? You ain't a nom anymore. He stopped when the corpse outside lifted a heavy arm and pulled himself a little closer to the light of the cafe. It was a slow and obviously painful move, desperate but hopeful. To hell with this! Greasy Apron said. He drew the butcher knife from his apron and began to round the counter. Stop right there, the vet said. He pointed a shaking finger at the cook and sidestepped to block his way. You ain't getting anyone else hurt for this stranger. He ain't one of ours anyway. One of ours? Paul mouthed, confused. Get out of my way, Greasy Apron said, raising the knife. The vet reciprocated by pointing the stump-nosed revolver at his chest. Oh, you wouldn't. Don't test me, the vet said, quickly lowering the gun to point at the cook's knee instead. One of ours? Paul said out loud. What do you mean by that? What? The vet asked, not looking away from the big man with the knife. Paul persisted. Now just hold on, you two. What do you mean by one of ours? I just mean... He's not from this diner, okay? A stranger. Not worth dying over. Greasy Apron scoffed. Ain't none of us friends, fella. I don't even know your names. Oh, you need to leave the jungle, man. We ain't on no team here. Maybe we are, Paul said. Or you are. Think about it. It's trying to lure someone out of here for some reason. If it wanted to just get anyone then it could have gotten me a long time ago when I was walking in. I mean, why else go through the trouble of the trap? Why not just snatch any old person off the road? Why not be happy with the victim he's already got? 
Man, I think you need a drink of what's in his pocket. Ducky chimed in. You're giving a lot of credit to a monster. Maybe, but if I'm right, then that means it doesn't want me or you two either. Paul pointed at the couple. Since you came in right before me, clearly it hadn't laid the trap for you. It could have snatched either of you up right off the bat. Think, guys, has anyone done anything to piss off whatever that thing is? Everyone looked at Paul like he was nuts. I know how this sounds. He began, but was interrupted by a low moan. A gurgling cry filtered through the glass. The injured man in the parking lot was trying to roll over. He moaned again. It sounded like help. Okay, fuck it, Paul continued. There's no time to figure this out. We've got to go out there. Like hell we do, said Dougie. Fine, then don't. But I'm rolling the dice here. I'm sure I'm right, Paul said. How sure? Asked Pink Sweater. Paul hesitated. And what if you're wrong? Paul thought for a second. Then I'll take that, he said, pointing to the gun. And I'll take that, Pink Sweater said, taking the knife gently from Greasy Apron's clenched fist. Honey, hold on, what are you... Dougie stammered. Well, we can't do it alone, she said uncertainly. That guy's dead weight. But baby... Shove it, Doug! Now, let's hurry before I lose my nerve. Right, Paul said. Let's go. He took the gun from the vet and walked on weak legs to the front door. Pink Sweater waved off Dougie's protest and pushed her way to Paul's side. The lock clicked loudly open. Together, they counted from three and opened the door. Three, two, one. Paul didn't remember the night being so cold, or so still. He remembered the sound of the trees creaking, swaying in the breeze beyond the shore of light cast by the gas station. Even that was gone now. He tightened his hold on the sweaty gun grips and moved forward. The sound of footsteps behind him gave him a start. He glanced back at the woman with the knife. He'd already forgotten she was there. She nodded. The injured man lying only a dozen or so feet away gave out a groan when he saw them approach. Was it a warning? Paul steeled himself and forced his eyes to move up and scan the rim of light. Nothing moved at first. Okay, grab an arm and let's... He started to say, but stopped short. To his left, just beyond the wavering rim of light, not three yards from the bumper of his beat-up old LeBaron, a shadow moved. What was that? The woman in the pink sweater quavered. She'd seen it too. For a moment, Paul had hoped it was his imagination. It moved again. A shadowed shape emerged and disappeared into the darkness. A low huffing sound echoed across the lot. No, not echoed. It came from the opposite direction. Paul warily moved his eyes to the sound. Another shadowed shape glinted through the trees. A huff drew his attention back to the original shape. It had moved again, but this time hadn't disappeared back into the shadows. It was huge. Hurry! Pink Sweater whispered, and Paul realized that he'd stopped moving. With tentative steps, he moved closer to the injured man until he was hovering over him. The man reached out a hand, supplicating, desperate. He groaned. Another huffing sound, almost a growl, rumbled through the air. The thing in the shadows shuffled around uneasily, then crouched until it was just another dark lump in the uneven night. Paul raised the gun. Another shadowed shape melted out of the darkness near it, then stood statue still, except for its clenching and unclenching fists. How many of them were there? Hurry! Pink Sweater whispered again. Paul crouched slowly, dropping one hand from the pistol grip to take the injured man's arm. The shadow shifted again. The thing crouched lower onto all fours, like a racer at the starting line. It's coming! Paul shouted, panic cracking in his voice. Three loud reports shattered the stillness of the night as he frantically pulled the trigger. 
a murder of crows sleeping in the trees, exploded into the night somewhere in the darkness beyond. A howl rent the air. Paul spun and fired twice more at where the other thing had been. A shot ricocheted distantly. He spun back to the first thing and saw it lurch into the light. It's still coming! He croaked and fired once more at the beast, now able to see its dark brown hair and grisly, ape-like face. It lurched again as a bullet slammed into its neck. A gout of black fluid belched out from the wound. Paul clicked off a few more spent chambers as the hollow snap of the hammer became lost amongst a din of howls that rose around the entire truck stop. So many! Paul's mind screamed. Hurry, damn it! Pink Sweater yelled. Raging voices echoed from the trees. Paul grabbed the injured man's arm and pulled. The woman in pink had dropped the knife and was pulling on his other arm with both hands. The man groaned in pain and terror. Together, they quickly dragged him to the glass door, which flung open to reveal the horrified face of the man in the greasy apron. His eyes were fixed on the shadows, his hand rapidly ushering them forward. They crossed the threshold and the door lock snapped shut loudly. Paul let go of the man's arm and half stumbled, half ran back to the kitchen. He let the gun clatter to the floor as he went, and when he saw the walk-in freezer, his wits abandoned him entirely. He flung open the door and stepped into the icy air, pulling it shut behind him. The howls clipped off with the closing of the door and were replaced by the hum of the cooling unit. Paul huddled in the corner, shivering, but not from the cold. A muffled voice said through the insulated door. I'm coming in real slow. Don't worry, sir. We've got it under control. Please step back from the door. Paul uncoiled the bent wire from the emergency release handle of the door, where he'd twisted it to keep those things out. He took a shivering step backwards, holding a pork loin over his head, ready to brain any furry, ape-like thing that crossed the threshold. Maybe it was a trap. Maybe it was one of those things. They'd been pounding and banging to get in for the last half hour. They'd even begun mimicking the voices of the other diner patrons, trying to get him to unlock the door so they could come in and get him. Maybe this was another trick and... The door creaked open slowly. Two men in blue uniforms stood with their hands out. One held a badge. Paul sighed and dropped the frozen chunk of meat. He nearly crumpled to the floor in exhaustion, but one officer caught him. He was ushered out into the diner, now glowing with the floodlights of a dozen squad cars. The other people from the diner were all sitting in the vinyl seats giving him acid stares. He realized that he'd half convinced himself that they'd been killed by the things while he locked himself in the freezer. Truth and shame slowly dawned on him. Sorry, he eked. They didn't reply. A gurney surrounded by paramedics was near the door. Paul looked over to see the injured man being strapped to it. He had his head up and was talking to one of the medics as she shone a bright light into his eyes. Paul walked over. There he is, the medic said, pointing to Paul. The man who pulled you to safety. The injured man said meekly, looking through glazed eyes. Not him. Is the one who pulled me out. Just relax. You've had a concussion. The medic said dismissively. No. I need to see him. Said the man. He looked over at Paul. Did you see him? Where is he? He saved my life. The injured man cringed with effort. His head dropped back on the pillow as the sedative took effect. A young officer sidled up to the cop standing behind Paul and said in hushed tones, Sir, we found the wreck about a mile up the road. It looks like a slide off, pretty well hidden in the underbrush. Probably wouldn't have even found it if he hadn't told us where it was. All right, rookie, get a wrecker out there. Lucky bastard would have died out there if someone hadn't come along. 
Someone? Cole echoed. Yeah, someone. Says a big man helped him out of the car, brought him here. Don't know nothing about that, would you? What? Thought so. What about those things? Cole asked. Whatever you shot, left a bloody patch over by that car, the cop replied. We've seen the tapes, don't really know what to tell you on that, but... A voice sounded from one of the vinyl booths. It was the man in the apron. They took the dead one after you valiantly hid yourself in our freezer. Then they left. We tried to tell you. He paused, then added sympathetically. I think they saved his life. Paul scowled. A wave of sudden realization flooded over him, followed by guilt. He pushed it away and sat down on a swivel stool at the counter. Shit. He sighed. I think I could use that coffee now. To Be Human Written by Andrew Harmon Performed by Tom Merritt Featuring Jonathan Jones and Alicia Pavlis Audio production and music by Jeff Clement Day one. We called him George on account of his curiosity. He was the first of his kind, as much a social experiment as a scientific one. He could walk, he could talk, he could learn. We consulted with every expert we could think of, from neuroscientists to behavioral analysts to robotics and electrical engineers. And although George was a four foot android, he was the closest thing to a son that I had. George had a large, round head and a body like a watermelon. Two stubby legs supported his squat frame, and he had two short arms with big white fingers. He was stocky, but surprisingly dexterous. George was a miracle in machine learning, programmed to emulate humans, but capable of little else. We had wanted to start from square one. No predefined rules or base knowledge. When we first switched George on, we thought that we had failed because it took him a solid two minutes to say a word. His animatronic head swiveled this way and that way, two blue LED eyes taking in everything they could find. His first words were, What am I? Self-reference straight out of the gate. You are George, I said. I'm George, he repeated. The days that followed, well, how can I put it all into words? It was a blur of wonder. George paced the floor, learning the names of my colleagues and every color and the names of all the equipment in the lab. When he came upon something new, George would point to it and we would gift him with a new word. Wash station and oscilloscope and servo and soldering iron grew like seeds in the garden of George's burgeoning vocabulary. We taught him base 10 counting, we taught him basic mathematics, and soon his digital brain could compute faster than ours. But our true intention was to impart to George the concept of humanity, and that sort of metaphysical idea simply cannot be taught in a stifled laboratory. George's public debut was set to take place at the International Conference on AI and Robotics in San Diego, and we were quite wary about the possibility that the news of the world's most cutting-edge artificial intelligence platform might be leaked ahead of schedule. I was due for a vacation at the time, so I saw no issue in bringing George along for the ride when my wife and I drove off to her parents' wooded property on Carlisle Lake in southern Illinois. It would, we figured, certainly hide George's existence from spying eyes. My wife, Chelsea, was a dazzling woman and by far the most wonderful human I had come across. She would, I felt confident, be a perfect example for George to follow. Chelsea was seven months pregnant at the time and so eager for our first child to be born that I figured she would get a real kick out of caring for a robot son for a couple weeks and in our Carlisle Lake cabin, I could teach George all about the natural world. Day three. The drive from New York to Illinois was long, but peaceful. 
George sat in the back seat, pointing out the window at the world flying past him. It zoomed by so quickly that he did not have time to ask me to name something before it was gone. My wife was not as pleased with my decision as I anticipated. Perhaps it was because George fell into that uncanny valley between familiar yet disturbingly different, a fairly common complaint issued by people regarding humanoid robots. He's kind of cute though, right? I said. Its eyes freak me out. Why does it keep staring at me? She asked. George is just curious. Isn't that right, George? George exclaimed, though his inflection fell a bit flat. Absolutely was a word I used profusely in the lab, and George had taken it up as his catchphrase. We arrived at the charming little cabin on Sunday afternoon, and the scene was picturesque. Leaves were budding in the trees, and the grassy fields had a breath of fresh green in them. The water of Carlisle Lake lapped lazily at the banks just down the hill. Birds whistled away as we unloaded the sedan, me doing most of the work as Chelsea had become permanently sore through her last trimester. Meanwhile, George was lumbering around the yard, his optic sensors overloaded by the vastness of Mother Nature. Though struggling with our bags, I did my best to answer his flurry of questions as best I could. Illinois, I told him. Trees, I said. Grass. Birds. Gravel. Cabin. His inquisitiveness delighted me, but I could sense that Chelsea was quickly growing irritated. I would like to say that we settled in for a romantic night in seclusion, but a busy man's life is never that simple. We had not been in the cabin more than four hours when the office called. A dire situation was unfolding, and my presence was mandatory. <sighs> Chelsea just sighed. She had been through this so many times before. There's no point arguing with you, James, she said. She ran a washcloth under warm water and swept it across her forehead, rather melodramatically, I thought. Your work is your life, not me, so just go. I will not go into the details of the fight that ensued. There were accusations and name-callings and bouts of crying. When it was all said and done, I assured her that I would return on Tuesday. I pleaded for her understanding. It is just a couple days. Then I will hop on a plane right back to you. I promise. What about him? Chelsea said, gesturing towards George. Training. For when this one comes. I smiled, brushing my palm over her swollen stomach. That thing is not my child. She said. She opened the pantry and took out a loaf of bread and peanut butter for sandwiches, then slammed it shut. I'll make sure it doesn't break. But that's about it. Day five. I was in Terminal 2 in the San Francisco airport on Tuesday, awaiting my return flight. I called Chelsea to let her know I would be boarding soon and to ask how things were going at the cabin. She said that she was getting bored being alone and asked if I would pick up extra groceries. She craved frozen pizza. And what about George? I asked. I tried to let him cook with me, but he just kept asking what food was and why I had to eat and to describe taste. How the hell do you describe what taste is? When he learned he couldn't eat, he lost interest. She said. So I just stuck him in front of the television and he hasn't budged since. Television? Genius, Chelsea, I cried. He will have constant human interaction. He'll get to explore the depths of emotion and human interaction. What is he watching right now? I don't know. She said. Baywatch, I think. Well, well. I suppose he gets to learn about human sexuality as well. I smiled into the phone and whispered, Maybe you and I can take a refresher course of our own when I get back tonight. She did not find my suggestiveness as amusing as I did. Soon after that, I was boarding my plane and twiddling my fingers impatiently on the armrest through the whole flight. I landed in St. Louis, took the shuttle to the rental car, and drove back across the river into Illinois and my planned vacation. When I arrived at the cabin, I spotted George standing down next to the lake, his white polymer body hunched over a bucket. I hurried over, worried that he might fall into the water and fry himself. The stench of fish in the air rattled me when I came close. George had scooped himself up a bucket of pond water with dozens of silvery minnows darting about inside. The grass all around George was strewn with dead fish and tiny splatters of their innards. What on earth are you doing? I asked, more intrigued than upset. These people were drowning, George droned. Why, these are not people, George. They're fish. 
They do not drown. They live in water, I said. Fish, he repeated. He stared down into the bucket, his bulbous white head processing the concept of living beings thriving in water. Teach me to perform CPR. I looked at the tiny corpses littering the grass around me. Their stomachs had all been pressed and dented in by George's unfeeling fingers. Was he acting out what he had seen on TV? Had he tried to save them all from drowning? Was this his attempt at CPR? His white fingertips were smeared in red. Day six. After the fish incident, Chelsea and I decided it would be best to subject George to more wholesome educational programming. He seemed quite confident to sit in front of the television set for hours on end, soaking up like a sponge every word that the drab documentary narrator spoke. I had been in such a hurry to get back to my Chelsea that I'd forgotten all about the trip to the store. The nearest market was half an hour away, so I kissed my wife's forehead and pulled on a hat before heading out again to procure the groceries. Chelsea stayed behind, sipping tea on the porch's rocking bench. As my sour luck would have it, the front left tire on our rental car went flat halfway into town. We were too deep in the middle of nowhere to get cell phone reception, so I had to hoof it. I knew Chelsea would be furious that I was taking so long, but what was I to do? A quick trip to the grocery store stretched into a several hour debacle, and by the time I got home, Chelsea had already eaten her dinner and left mine cold on the plate. I felt that we were on the brink of another fight, so to defuse the situation, I suggested we take a stroll through the woods, alone. We left George in front of the TV set with images of Amazonian birds and squirrel monkeys flashing before his eyes. It was a cool, peaceful night, and so our walk turned into an evening entirely spent on the porch with a small fire crackling in the pit. Chelsea went to bed after a while, but I stayed up a little longer to study the stars. Time and fatigue eventually got the best of me, and I dozed off for an hour or two before I woke up cold and slinked back into the house. Perhaps the most disconcerting aspect of George is the fact that he does not sleep. It was well past midnight when I came in, and George's blue eyes glowed just as voraciously as the nature documentary before him. On the screen, a trio of lions lounged in the tall grass, their black lips stained with fresh blood. Behind them lay a zebra's carcass picked clean, its yellow bones spackled in biting flies. George heard me trudging through the living room. When I paused behind the couch, his round head turned 180 degrees on his shoulders, and he stared right at me. Teach me about death, he said. Day 7. After breakfast, I noticed that George was not glued to the couch as he had been when I had left him the night before. I finished my coffee and pulled on my boots, then set out to figure out to where he might have roamed off. I would be lying to say I wasn't nervous. This was a multi-million dollar android, and I realized I had been acting quite carelessly with him. I found George squatting in the trees not far from the back porch. The odor of rotting flesh overwhelmed me as I approached. George did not seem to pay me any mind. He was staring down at a dead raccoon. Morning dew was glistening on its mottled fur, signaling that it had been there overnight. Did you do this, George? What is the purpose of dying? George asked. Well, it is not really something we intend to do. It just happens, I answered. Will I die as well? No, George, you will not die per se. You are not exactly living in the first place. Okay, George said flatly. He reached a hand down and kneaded the dead animal's ribcage. And what is the purpose of killing? We do not kill, George, I was quick to answer. We never kill. Animals kill, George said. People kill in wars. Why do they do this? Well, wars are complicated. When people really want something badly enough, they kill other people to get it. Absolutely, George said. I took George back into the house, careful not to mention anything to Chelsea about the raccoon just yet. She was already freaked out by George, and I didn't want to exacerbate things. We turned off the television and let him tag along with us as we happily frittered the day away. That night, Chelsea and I decided on a name for the baby. Matthew. Day 8. 
In a decision I regretted almost immediately, I caved over breakfast and told Chelsea about the raccoon and the minnows. She got sick at the idea. She called him a cold, emotionless machine and implored me to shut him off before he got any more ideas about death. I reassured her that George was harmless. She spent most of the day in bed. In the early evening, Chelsea's mother called. They lived an hour from the cabin in Hillsboro, and they needed someone there immediately. Chelsea's father had fallen in the shower and refused to call an ambulance or ask the neighbors for help. He was a proud man, struggling to adjust to old age. Her mother was too weak to get him up by herself, but she had convinced him to let us help. I agreed that we would be right there to assist, but Chelsea was feeling too sick for a long car ride. I certainly did not want to bring the culture shock of a talking robot into her elderly parents' home. Though Chelsea protested the idea of being left alone with George, I came up with a solution. We should teach him morality. I sat George in front of the television again and flipped to a channel on the far end of the spectrum that played nothing but televangelist sermons and gospel choirs. Surely he could learn right from wrong this way, and Chelsea would be free to spend the night as she pleased. Before I left, she retired to the bedroom and locked herself in. I thought she was silly for being afraid of harmless little George. I crouched down in front of the couch and said to George, I have to go for a few hours. You sit right here and watch only this channel, okay? These shows will teach you human morality. You want to be more human, correct? Absolutely, George said. Day nine. How could I have been so blind, so ignorant? This next part is hard for me to write. I guess I should start by explaining what George had calculated in my absence. Hours upon hours of sermons filled his digital brain with ideas of souls and paradise and hell and demons. The white-haired preachers told George that only righteous souls could go to the good place. Everyone else went to a bad place. A terrible, awful place. And while George did not understand the concepts of heaven and hell, he was certain that he would prefer to go to good places. George recalled the day with the raccoon when I explained that he was not a living thing, that he would not die. And the preachers were steadfast in their assertion that one must first die to go to the good place. If George had any chance of living, and therefore any chance of dying, and even still a chance of going to the good place, he would first need a soul. The preachers smiled their confident, dimpled smiles and told George that a soul was created at birth. If George was to have a soul, he reasoned, he needed to be birthed. I came in early the next morning, around four o'clock. The trip had taken much longer than I expected. Instantly, I noted the darkness and silence and saw the television had been turned off and George no longer resided on the couch. Passing through the kitchen, I saw that the fillet knife was missing from the cutlery block. The door to our bedroom was ajar. I pushed it open with quivering hands. My deepest, most hideous fear lay before me. Chelsea was sprawled atop the mattress, her arms thrown out to her sides, her legs twisted up beneath her, her eyes empty and lifeless. White sheets were wet with her blood. George lay curled beside her, pushing his cold frame into her side. Beside him, the fillet knife dripped red. He had sliced my poor Chelsea from the base of the sternum down to her pelvis and pried her open. His white hands were bright red where he had pushed them inside of her and made room for himself. He made room for himself beside Matthew. Did, did, did you really do this? I stammered. I collapsed in the doorway, unable to look away from the nightmarish tableau and clasped my hand over my mouth. I tasted vomit in my throat. Absolutely, George repeated. Why? Why would you do this? Dear God. George lifted his head off the sheets 
and stared at me with those pitiless, unblinking blue eyes. I wanted something badly. I killed to get it. I hurled bile right there on the floor. My whole body shook violently. I wanted to march across the room and bash George to oblivion. I wanted to cave in his round white head. I wanted to rip out his circuitry and motherboards and wires. But I couldn't even stand. You you did all of this to be human? Absolutely. We called him George, on account of his curiosity. Camper Appreciation Written by Seth Paul Performed by Stephen Schneers Come on, Jim, you know it's gonna suck. I didn't nod, but I wanted to. Mark was right as usual. Most of camp had sucked, to be honest. Tom, on the other hand, tried once more to be the voice of reason, even as he tugged up his shorts and kicked at a rock at the ground. Guys, we're gonna get in trouble. Everyone else is going. Mark sighed and adjusted his glasses. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Didn't you see that old movie where everyone on board the airplane eats the fish and they all get sick? As we looked up at the big camper appreciation night banner above the cafeteria door, I decided then and there we would ditch. Not like we'd miss much. A couple of songs, some pats on the back, the Hope Patchy Awards, which everyone was pretty sure were insensitive to somebody somewhere. In fact, the only good thing about camp at all was the reason we were ditching. Yeah, Mark, let's do it. My man! Mark slapped me on the back, a big, wide, stupid grin on his face. Even if it turns out to be nothing special, at least we had an adventure. That's what camp's all about, right? Camp Quiet Ridge had not been an adventure, to say the least. Oh sure, me, Mark, and Tom had always had fun at our old camp, Camp Bendix Point, but it had closed that year thanks to a lice infestation. Luckily, an old camp, refurbished and under new management, got a hold of the Bendix Point mailing list and suddenly every parent in the Tri-County area was thanking their lucky stars that their rugrats had something to do that summer. The director, Barry, seemed like a nice enough guy. But after the first day rained out the archery competition and it was discovered that most of the canoes had been ruined by a squirrel, things went downhill from there. The nature hikes were slow and nobody saw any cool animals, the crafts weren't anything to write home about, and, well, the counselors were all bored. To top it all off, during the week somebody had smashed up the windows in the cafeteria. They were never caught, but plywood had to be put up. Thankfully, the lights inside worked most of the time. Seeing how his whole effort was going down the drain, Barry decided to cancel that upcoming Thursday's wallet-making session to invite the whole place down to the lake to hear him tell ghost stories. It seemed like a long shot, but by that point, pretty much everyone in the place felt so bad for him that we all obliged. We didn't need to worry. He was good. Really good. Some of his stuff really did make our skin crawl. And a few times I looked out over the lake to the woods on the far side, imagining ghosts and goblins lurking out in the woods, watching us. The tale that got to me the most, though, was one he told about a family, which had camped out there many years ago, that had mysteriously disappeared. A young man, his wife, and their two children were warned that there was a murderer that lived out in the woods but they didn't listen. The killer lived in an old house, built by a logger at the turn of the century, and they set up camp far too close to his home. Then, one night, while they slept, he came upon their tent, and with a few fell swoops of an axe, he killed every last 
one of them. He then feasted on the remains and buried them up in a shack. I recall Barry finishing his cautionary tale with a totally unnecessary warning. So don't go out into the woods alone, because the killer might be out there. He could be anywhere, even here. Then he jumped at a couple of campers who screamed with delight. The story sounded like total crap. Ever since the slasher movies of the 80s, every camp has had some story about some murderer roaming the woods. At this point, they're practically mascots. Heck, even Bendix Point had the legend of Old Charlie, a hermit who chased bad little kids with a chainsaw in hand and a bag over his head. The thing is, there was a house. At least that's what Mark said. He had wandered off on Tuesday while our bunkhouse was trying to put together a paper mache totem pole in the activity center up in the hills. And he saw a small little house, barely bigger than a hut, hiding up a little ways in the woods. He didn't think much of it at the time. Only when he heard the story did he put two and two together. Now, none of us believed for a second that we'd find a bunch of dead bodies up in that house. But the three of us were the curious type. Something like that was just too good a deal to pass up. It was away from camp, probably abandoned, and we figured we'd have a ton of fun digging through trash to see if we could find anything to take home. At that point, somebody's old junk was better than any of the crap we had made the whole week at camp. My leather wallet, for instance, looked more like a foot than anything I could keep money in. Besides, we wouldn't be gone all night. We'd be back before anyone called on a search. And if they did, so what? Considering our phone book-sized permanent records at school, it's not like we weren't used to getting into trouble. Tom was the best among us, but he still did whatever we told him to do. I still don't know. I rolled my eyes. Tom, if you don't come with us, I'm putting a snake in your underwear before we go. There's no snakes in these woods. I'll buy one. Jeez, all right. See, did whatever we said. Mark led the way. We had just reached the edge of the camp center when we heard whistling and saw Barry walking around outside the mess hall. We ducked low and watched him as he went over to the main doors, looking around as if to make sure everyone was safely in, and pulled the latches on the door so they could shut. I did feel a little twang of guilt. I really couldn't help but feel bad for the guy. He kind of reminded me of what Tom might look like when we got older. A little chunky, balding a bit under that cap of his, but always smiling and friendly. Even if a little gullible and naive. Still, the lure of adventure won out and Mark whispered for us to go. Barry wasn't paying any attention anyway. He was fumbling in his pocket for keys or something. We skirted up into the hills, back up to the activity center. It was slow going, being uphill, and we had to hold up for Tom once or twice, as he wasn't exactly in the kind of shape required for most summer camps. Once we made it to the top, Mark pointed up into the pine trees. Up there. As soon as you break the tree line, you can see it. Probably take five minutes to get there. I smiled. Awesome, let's go. We waited a moment. Mark shifted his weight. Huh. You go first. You brought us here, you should go. Uh, I told you we shouldn't have come. We both turned to Tom. Shut up, Tom! An owl hooted. Great. We hadn't seen anything other than a few squirrels and songbirds that year up to that point. Of course, the wildlife picked the worst possible time to show up. Just as we started to get cold feet. I decided we wouldn't get anywhere unless someone stepped up, and if that wasn't going to be Mark... It certainly wasn't going to be Tom, either. All right, fine. I'll go first. Up until that point, we had relied on the moonlight to lead us. But once we stepped into the trees, it got dark. Really dark. Like, locked in the closet by my older brother when I was six dark. I got out my little pen light from the pack of camping accessories my parents got me on my first day of camp and pointed it up the hill, shining it around looking for the house. 
It took a little while to find it, but once my beam landed on it, there was no mistaking it. It looked like a place a logger would have built, with mostly wooden walls, but somebody who was clearly not a logger had added a crummy side room onto the place. At one time or another, it appeared to have been painted white, and its windows were busted out. Its door hung loosely on its hinges. I remember thinking at the time that it was way more awesome than Camper Appreciation Night. I climbed up, with Mark following closely behind, and Tom stumbling his way after the both of us, until we reached the door, and I pushed it open. Inside, the place was a wreck. Busted, useless furniture filled nearly every corner. Old tin cans, rusted and forgotten, covered a large portion of the floor. The mess continued on through an open doorway to an old kitchen, with a busted gas stove and an old latching refrigerator, the type mothers always say never to play with. There'd been no power to them, obviously, but it was still a wonderland of garbage to sift through. And that's when I saw something metallic gleaming, partially obscured by the dirt and leaves littering the kitchen floor. I brushed the remaining dirt away and found a handle. Holy crap, guys, look! Tom came over first and his eyes widened. Is that? I nodded and pulled it hard. A square of the floor rose up, revealing a small, dirty crawl space and pure darkness beyond. Tom gasped. You, you think there's... Of course not. There's no dead bodies under here. But even I couldn't believe my own words. What if some psycho really had been living up in these woods and he buried some bodies in here? It certainly looked possible. Mark, Mark, come over here and... I looked behind me and saw that Mark was still in the main room, bent over and thoroughly examining something. He was turning it over in his hands. I left the trap door open and went over to see what he was doing. What is that? When Mark looked up at me, his pale, shaken expression was enough to put me ill at ease. But then I saw the source of his concern for myself. In his hands was a pair of binoculars. Modern ones. Only slightly scuffed and dirty, where hands had been touching them. Where did you find those? Mark pointed below the broken window. I had overlooked that pile while investigating the kitchen, but it now had our full attention. And it was obvious in an instant that the things we were seeing shouldn't have been in that house. We saw cans that were not only in pristine condition, but sealed. Beside a pile of old, tattered blankets was a modern sleeping bag. I looked out the window. Most of the outside was unobservable in the darkness, but there was a small spot where the moonlight made it possible to get a glimpse of our surroundings. Taking the binoculars from Mark, I looked out at that point. It wasn't much, but I could see the center of camp and the cafeteria from there. It was far off, but clear enough that in the daytime, I would have been able to see a lot. Then something moved in front of the light. I lowered the binoculars and I saw a shape amidst the blackness, its outline visible thanks to a small light it was carrying, which was pointed to the ground. It looked a bit like a flashlight beam, though it was covered, presumably to keep others from seeing it. For several moments, I stared trance-like at the wandering stranger, until the sudden sound of approaching footsteps startled me, breaking the silence. Oh, crap! I whispered, dropping the binoculars. I grabbed Mark. Someone's coming! Mark froze, his earlier resolve to ditch camp seemingly gone. I grabbed his arm and looked for a rear exit. There wasn't one. There was no door out to the back, and all the windows faced to the front. Apparently loggers were not known for following fire escape standards. Guys, here! Tom waved to the trap door. I had my second thoughts, to be sure. The crawlspace wasn't exactly inviting, but I wasn't weighing many options. Whoever, or whatever, was coming towards us was definitely not a camp counselor. And my mind conjured up nothing but images of chainsaws, knives, and the thought of all of us skinned and hanging from the rooftop flooded my mind. 
with those images flashing through my head, we really had no choice. I pulled Mark towards the trapdoor and dropped in. Tom came in after us and pulled it shut. It was quiet upstairs for a few moments. It was dry and dusty and I could feel cobwebs all over. I wasn't sure if there were spiders still living in them, but I still felt like prickles going up and down my skin. The front door opened. We held our breath as footsteps trumped back and forth in the next room, followed by a short, sharp yell. There was a thunk sound, and a can went scurrying across the floor. Oh no, I thought. He must have noticed his stuff was touched. Through the darkness, Tom reached for me and grabbed me by the shoulder, squeezing tightly. Normally I would have elbowed him as hard as possible, but right then I didn't mind in the least. The footsteps shuffled around a little, and... We watched in horror as the beam of the covered light danced through the gaps in the floorboards until at last the intruder stopped in the kitchen, directly over the spot where we were hiding. The light shone over the trapdoor, the same trapdoor we had recently unearthed. As the light passed over the three of us, we tried to duck down as low as we could, moving as little as possible and holding our breath. But in a moment... The light caught his face, and I saw who had been living in the house. It was a man, older than my dad, maybe in his fifties, if I could even guess. He was dirty, with brown streaks smudging his face. But while I normally imagined homeless guys as having long beards, crazy unkempt hair, and even crazier eyes, this man only had a few days worth of stubble and short hair with a few flecks of gray. His eyes, though, were constantly moving, as if something was always darting around in front of them. They were also wide, practically bulging out of his head, like he was genuinely scared that something was in the room with him. And then he shone the light right between the boards. The brightness of the beam forced me to blink and avert my gaze as my pupils dilated abruptly. And in that moment, his eyes stopped darting around. Tom and Mark didn't move, didn't breathe even. But none of that helped when I saw the smile slowly start to cross the man's face. I waited for him to fling open the trap door and yank us all out and tie us up, ready to put us on a spit. But instead, he went over and grabbed the stove. And with a horrible squealing sound, he positioned it over the top of the trap door. Once the dragging stopped, the man trudged into the other room, leaving us alone in the dark. Tom began whimpering. Meanwhile, I put my eye as close to the floorboards as I could, and I stared in silence. Courtesy of what little light the old man's dim flashlight offered, I watched him rummage through his pile of things. A moment later, he found what he was searching for. A long object with one end larger and fatter than the other. When he hoisted his light again, I saw it was an axe. My blood stopped circulating. A darkness greater than that of the crawl space seemed to envelop me, and the world appeared to swirl. I awoke a short time later, to the sight of Tom before me, slapping me repeatedly. Jim, wake up! You fainted! I sat up. What? Ugh. What happened? I heard something click and saw my pen light came on. Tom swung it under his face. He left. I I don't know where he went, but he's not here. I rubbed my face and noticed my hands were shaking. We weren't dead. Not yet, anyway. Where's Mark? Tom showed the light on Mark, who was balled up and rocking back and forth. On the one hand, I didn't blame him for freaking out. But I did want to crawl over and slap him for getting us into this. I pushed at the trap door, but the stove now blocking our way had to weigh more than the three of us combined. We weren't getting out that way. So, what now? Tom shook his head. I I don't know. There's got to be something. Here, take the light and look. The crawl space was incredibly gross. No matter where I directed the beam of light, I discovered old cobwebs, debris, and even the bones of squirrels and rats that had gotten stuck over the years. A sight that didn't exactly boost my confidence. There were no spaces around the edge we could crawl through. Where there wasn't raw earth, 
there was stone foundation. If we wanted to dig our way out, we'd have a very hard time doing it. I turned my attention to the floor above us. In certain places, the dirt was so thick that it completely blocked our view of the house above. Regardless, I tested each and every one of the boards I could reach. It was near the old refrigerator, near the rear of the space where I found our first and only possible means of escape. Perhaps the ceiling had leaked at one time, but for whatever the reason, the wood there was really soft. And when I scraped it with my fingernail, bits of it flaked off. Get over here! I called out. Tom came right away, but Mark had to be coaxed. I told everyone we needed to get on our backs and kick as hard as we could. Tom and Mark agreed to give it a try, as we had no other options. The first collective kick merely shook the floor but the second strike elicited a loud crunching noise as part of the floor splintered. I would have jumped for joy if I had been able to. A third followed, producing more cracks and then a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. Ten kicks later, the floorboards were in their death throes, and with a final push outwards and upwards, they finally gave way. I wasted no time. I clambered up through the hole, wholly unconcerned about splinters and scrapes. I didn't care. We were free! and cuts were the least of our worries. I helped Tom and Mark out, and we bolted out the front door with abandon. We took off down the hill, yelling and screaming our heads off, hoping someone from camp would hear us. As we entered the campgrounds and ran past the nurse's station, our collective instincts kicked in and we came to a halt and stood silently. Something was wrong. Looking around, we noticed that the camp was only barely lit. No one had come to help us or even stepped out of a building to see what all the noise was about. The camp was deserted. The only place that was still lit was the cafeteria. We ran up to it and tried the front door. It didn't budge, but something on it rattled. In my haste to try and get in, I had failed to notice the large metal chain, visible in the moonlight, that had been padlocked into place around the handles. We went door to door and found the exact same thing over and over again chains and padlocks. Only the final door was accessible. It had obviously been secured like the others at some point, but someone must have really wanted to get in. What remained of its chains was in pieces and on the ground. I hesitated before opening the door. We found ourselves in a back hall that led to several different doors. The closest opened into the kitchen. Again, empty, and again, not what we should have seen on Camper Appreciation Night. The lights were on, though, and it felt safer than the back hallway. The only other exit from the kitchen was through the double doors that led into the cafeteria itself. We listened intensely for a moment, but heard nothing to suggest we had company. I pushed against the doors. Something was blocking them, but whatever the obstruction was, it began to give way as I applied more pressure. I mustered all the strength I had and shoved as hard as I could. And to this day, I wish I had left that door shut. The scene before me was one that will stay with me for the rest of my life. The hall was soaked with blood from top to bottom. Bodies lay at grotesque angles covering the entire floor. We found all of the tables overturned and splintered. There were deep gashes in the plywood window frames, accompanied by streaks of blood and fragments of broken fingernails. Limbs dangled from the rafters. It was an absolute slaughterhouse. The whole camp must have been in there. Every last man, woman, child, and bored teenage counselor. All in pieces. Pieces with the flesh ripped right off of their bones. I scrambled backwards and shut the door. That was when we heard the scream. The unholy, awful scream. It came from the back hallway. I ran towards it. Everything told me to run away, but a small part of me needed an explanation for the carnage I had just seen. Tom and Mark, wide-eyed and trembling, stood and stared as I sprinted in the direction of the sound. I thought I heard them calling out to me, demanding I come back. I didn't listen. The sound had come from the head office. I yanked open the door, and there, pushing me back into the hallway was the hobo. He held me with his right hand and he looked me right in the eyes. I looked away, 
and realized why he wasn't using his left hand. His whole left arm was gone, raggedly torn away. His grip loosened and he collapsed on the floor. I then heard noises coming from the office, a series of wheezing, gurgling grunts. I was drawn forward. I couldn't resist even if I had wanted to. I felt as if the nightmare wouldn't end until I knew what was happening and who was responsible. Something round and pulsating poked up from behind the main desk. I went around it and saw the shape was the stretched stomach of some... thing. I tried to get a good look at its face but couldn't see much due to the fact that an axe had been buried deep within it. It appeared to be... melting puddling like a candle into carpeting, and leaving behind a rotten stench. Holes began to appear in its impossibly large stomach, and I could see fingers, shoes. It had eaten everyone. The whole camp. Everyone but the three of us. No, not it. Him. Even without seeing its face, I recognized the worn baseball cap of Barry, still perched on its head. The rest was a blur. Tom called the police. They came. They comforted us as best they could. What had remained of Barry was gone, leaving behind only the cannibalized remains of the people he'd failed to fully digest. I led the police to the hut where the now dead man with the axe had come from. They ran prints on his remaining arm. They blamed him for all the deaths. Everyone's parents were informed. Our own parents hugged us tight, wailing and weeping tears of joy that we had not been among the victims. The three of us, Tom, Mark, and I, never went to camp again. Though ironically, I ended up seeing a lot of counselors. <sighs> the police did find a match for the fingerprints. Forty years ago, a twelve-year-old boy by the name of Jeremiah had been found in the woods, unable to speak. No one knew what happened to his family. From what the police could gather, they had all gone camping near Quiet Ridge. But their campsite was found empty. As the boy wouldn't speak to anyone, let alone testify, the authorities assumed the worst. However, no bodies or evidence of foul play was ever found. Jeremiah spent years in halfway homes, never saying a word to anyone. He wasn't violent or mean-spirited, but he had never operated at a level that suggested he could take care of himself, and ultimately he was confined to the Newbridge Retreat Facility. He'd been there ever since, until, believe it or not, the same Wednesday that my friends and I were at Camp Quiet Ridge. That night, without warning and to the dismay of his caretakers, he left. A crumpled flyer for the camp, which had been hastily torn from a bulletin board in the visitor's area, was later found in his room. I saw the flyer. It had a picture of Barry's smiling face on it. I know, because the same one had been sent to our house. When police showed us other pictures of Barry, they looked nothing like the Barry we knew. We had never known the real Barry at all. Just whatever had pretended to be him all that time. My guess is that whatever was responsible for the massacre at camp had dealt with Barry just before Camp Quiet Ridge opened, and no one was the wiser. Suddenly, the broken canoes, the broken and boarded up windows, the warning urging us to never leave campgrounds made sense. The events of Camper Appreciation Night hadn't been done on a whim. They'd been planned for some time. I could only imagine what Jeremiah had gone through keeping his knowledge of the beast a secret for 40 years. Whatever his reasons for keeping quiet until the end, I now have my own secrets, and I intend to keep mine. The last remaining knowledge of what Barry truly was will be buried with me someday. But what exactly he was, I, I still don't know. I don't want to know. And thanks to Jeremiah, who sacrificed himself in his efforts to destroy it and save our lives, I hope I never will. In the end, the man we had figured for a crazed madman trying to kill us was, in fact, an unlikely hero, keeping us safe in his own strange way. More ironically, Tom, Mark, and I 
who as kids couldn't keep out of trouble, are alive today because we disobeyed camp rules. If there's a moral in this, I don't know what it is. It doesn't seem like we should have survived what became known as the massacre at Quiet Ridge. I still have nightmares. Marks are the worst. Tom, thankfully, is doing okay. In fact, ever since then, we let him make most of the decisions now. Essentially, we've all recovered, as much as one can, I suppose, and we've moved on, graduated, gotten jobs, settled down and raised families. We should consider ourselves lucky. But there is one lingering thought that still remains. I always think back to that day, to what Barry really was, and can't help but wonder if he was the only one of his kind. I hope and pray that there were no others. I'm not about to go on some adventure to find out. I'm no hero. These days, I try to stay as far away from the woods as possible. This means that all of you, and your children, are on your own. If you're going to camp, or sending your kids to one, and you hear rumor of a camper appreciation night, watch out. You may find that the camp director's idea of appreciation is far, far different than your own. The Mourner Written by Gareth Shaw Performed by Alicia Pavlis Featuring David Lewis Richardson and Peter Bishop Audio production and music by Jeff Clement With their black clothing and hats jeweled by the combined moistures of drizzle and fog, the huddled mourners looked beautiful through the zoom lens. Katie panned the camera across the throng to better admire the perfection of the scene. Long overcoats, sleek shirts, heels stabbing into the grass, banded homburgs, even a scattering of spiderwebbed veils, all spoke of the wealth and power gathered round the open grave, like Hollywood's idea of the perfect somber funeral. The fog swirled, gravestones leaned in the foreground, and the limp branches of a willow provided a sway of green backdrop so that the mourners were like black opals lying against a jeweler's felt. The camera clicked and froze the image forever. Excellent. A fine picture, all would agree, but not good enough for Katie right then. Not when she could sense perfection hovering within reach. She waited for the final detail to slot into place and create the shot, the one guaranteed to accompany that month's feature article. All that stood, literally, between Katie and her big breakthrough was a thin man in what looked to be an ill-fitting suit, his sloping shoulders narrow but just wide enough to obscure the star of the show and many others. The recently widowed Felicity Royal, her wide hat haloed the man's head in black, but her face was hidden. Come on, move, she urged him through gritted teeth, shifting as the damp grass started to soak through her jeans. Like a suddenly flourished handkerchief, the priest stepped out of the throng and stood looking into the grave to the left of the shot, his bright white robes contrasting perfectly with the gloominess of the falling light. He started to speak. Katie could hear the drone but not make out the words from her prone position behind a manicured hedge, and the mourners' heads bowed as one. Shit, this is it, move your ass! She hissed at the thin man. A woman's head dropped onto the shoulder of her companion. Come on, for God's sake! The priest's hands clasped a blood-red Bible to his chest. All she could think was, not quite the one, not quite the one. Not quite the one. Never before had she wished anyone dead. Truly and sincerely and horribly dead. But she wished a whole range of grisly fates on that thin man right then. Each passing second, each click of the camera meant the chance, this glorious, possibly once-in-a-career chance, was slipping away. 
All thanks to some skinny bastard in an overpriced suit. Katie hissed through her nostrils as the priest's words ended. Several of the throng shifted slightly, about to lift their heads. She screamed silently behind the shrubbery, wrestling with her fury to keep the camera still. Damn it. Then it happened. The skinny man stepped to his right, just one step, to pat someone on the elbow, and suddenly the widow herself, Felicity Royal, a mascara streaked crimson lipstick version of the Felicity Royal who had graced televisions the country over for years, glanced up at the overcast heavens, her ashen face emerging like a beacon from under her hat whilst those around her still gloomed at the sodden ground. The chief editor beamed and thumped his desk. Now that. He boomed, jabbing a finger at the laptop screen in front of him. It's 15 carats solid golf. Katie smiled the modest smile she had practiced in the mirror a couple of hours ago when the summons to the office of Peep had come through. The fact that the magazine had been in touch mere minutes after she emailed the photo confirmed the feeling that had tingled through her since she had captured the perfect shot at the cemetery. This was it. Peep's chief editor spun the laptop round to her, and Katie's modesty crumbled in the glow of her photograph on the screen. A shadowy, somber masterpiece etched out in pin-sharp, high resolution. Oh, not right now, Catherine. The editor almost shouted and Katie flinched, the grin dying on her face. Come on, you bloody paid those people to pose, didn't you? Couldn't be better if you told them where to stand. She breathed in relief and adjusted her skirt over her knees. Just in the right place at the right time, I suppose. The editor sat back, pulling the laptop back towards him, eyes on the screen and laughed. You make that sound like luck. That's the trick of your job, isn't it? Katie watched his eyes flicker around the image, seeing how they constantly came back to the pale, upward-turned face of Felicity Royal and knew with a flush of heat that thousands would soon do the same thing when they saw the front cover of Peep on the shelves in a month's time. Bloody hell, the composition is perfect. The editor continued in a more hushed voice, as if seeing the photograph for the first time. The mourners, the trees, the gravestones. He paused for a breath. And her, beautiful and sad and lost, all at the same time. The punters are going to lap it up. Looking at the back of the laptop's lid, Katie remembered the widow in that one moment and the raw, naked pain on Felicity Royal's face that had never been seen on a television screen, a pain that the public was soon to hungrily drink in. For the first time, she felt the faintest needle prick of guilt. But then the editor lowered the screen and the talk turned to money and royalties and an extended contract. The meeting ended quickly, with promises of being in touch soon and a brisk handshake. Oh, Catherine. The editor stopped her before she closed the door. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as perfection, you know. She frowned in puzzlement. We'll have to airbrush the weirdo out. He spoils the mood a bit. No big deal. Speak to you on Tuesday. Katie, still frowning, clicked the door shut with hot hands and hurried to the lift already reaching for the tablet in her bag. Weirdo. She shakily opened the photo file and peered at the image she thought she knew so well. What had the editor said? He spoils the mood a bit. He. Katie scanned the mourners, seeing them all anew. They were actually people now, not glamorous funeral mannequins. Their faces contorted or slackened or rigid with genuine grief. She picked out the men, all holding onto female hands or arms or shoulders, all except one. A thin man, the one who had moved just in time, stood turned to the side and he stood alone. His face was lined and angular in profile, his eye hidden in the shadow of a deep socket that made him appear to be in his fifties at least, in a black suit that, now Katie looked more closely, wasn't particularly expensive. His gaunt face bowed to the open grave and hands clasped. He looked every inch the mourner, apart from the fact that he was grinning.
The wrought iron cemetery gates loomed grandly against a big sky of cloudless blue, inviting Katie inside onto a path that wound amongst the grass and gravestones. The sun made her squint, but curling leaves pooling in the lengthening shadows of tree trunks signaled the final days of summer, and she zipped up her jacket. In the distance, across the spiky, stony sweep of headstones, a high fence of iron spears and broad trees marked the section of the cemetery that was closed off to the ordinary members of the public. Further along the fence, there was a slight gap where she had squeezed through a few days ago. The private section was where Felicity Royal's husband was buried, where she had taken what promised to be a career-defining photograph, where a thin man had stood amongst a grieving crowd and smiled. The hollow indented eye socket, the laughter lines spiderwebbing from one corner of his eye, the long crease from cheek to clean-shaven chin, the pale, pale lips pursed in amusement, all magnified on Katie's laptop screen, had haunted her ever since. She couldn't get over the wrongness of his expression. Again and again she had peered at the faces of all the mourners, trying to spot one of them sharing the thin man's smile. She unconsciously capitalised him now, trying to see anything that might have sparked his humour. Their expressions varied slightly, but all were contorted in sadness. Perhaps the man was remembering some joke he'd shared with the deceased, or a happy memory. But somehow that didn't explain it. At first, the sneaky nature of the smile had convinced her the thin man was pleased that Mr. Royal was dead, and she began to contrive all sorts of plots and crimes that he might be guilty of. He was a jealous brother, a scheming business partner, a murderous family physician. She soon dismissed such soap opera thinking, but could not shift the conviction that he was guilty of something other than a severe lack of empathy or tact. A breath of wind edged with autumn ruffled Katie's hair, and she looked up to see that she had reached the end of the public section of the cemetery. The gate at the path's end was only slightly smaller than the main entrance, but padlocked with opening times posted in a glass case and directions pointing to a porter's lodge. Here, the public gravestones were older, their edges rounded with names faded or mossed over. The air was damper and darker here, the sun screened by a thick green canopy of trees overhanging the private fence, but it was quiet and restful. Spurts of unkempt grass wavered in another gust as if waving goodbye to warmer seasons. The graves and verges nearer the main entrance were cleaner and trimmed and ordered, but Katie liked the sense of freedom and privacy here. She supposed that this distant corner would be pretty spooky at night, but in the September sunshine it was... Beautiful, someone said. Katie yelped and spun around. Isn't it? The thin man asked standing nearby, staring at her. Yes, Katie answered reflexively, taking a small step back, hand fluttering to her chest before she could stop it. Pale lips pursing, the thin man smiled, a smile that she knew so well, and the sight of it so close to her made her feel dizzy and unreal. He turned away and bent over to peer at a crumbling gravestone. There's a bench there. It took Katie a moment to focus on what he had just said. Take a seat, he said, rubbing some moss away from an inscription. His voice was soft and oddly comforting, like a granddad's voice. She looked around, saw the bench behind her and sat down, frowning at the tremble in her thighs. Get a grip of yourself, girl. Bloody hell. Look at the age of him. You could knock him over with one hand. Up close... Katie saw that he was a lot older than she had first thought, perhaps in his eighties, judging by the veins showing through the papery skin on his knuckly hands. They didn't so much as quiver as he cleaned the headstone, however, and he moved with slow certainty, not even bending his knees to reach down. White hair swept back, covered his head, and rested like strands of cotton on his collar. The thin man's suit had once been expensive, she could tell by the cut but had the stiff shininess of unwashed black worn too often. His trousers ended just above grey socks, adding to the slight air of shabbiness that hung about him. In her photograph, he had looked a lot more smart, a lot sharper. The suit wasn't right on him, she decided. 
It hung awkwardly about him, creasing and folding in the wrong places. He'd probably had it for years and had shrunk like old men do, age withering them into shadowy versions of their former selves. He was certainly thin. The padded suit shoulders drooped significantly, but he didn't seem fragile in the slightest. That's better, he said, flicking away the last bit of moss and standing upright. Katie squinted. He sort of rolled smoothly upright rather than jerkily straightening, as she expected. He saw her watching and placed a hand on his lower back while stretching extravagantly, his smile crooking into a grimace. I should take it easy. These old bones crumble at me more and more each day. Bloody charlatan. You're more limber than me, Katie thought, but smiled sympathetically. The thin man gestured to the bench, smiling again. Mind if I take the weight off these achy legs? Trying not to hesitate, Katie slid over and placed her handbag between them. She crossed her legs and pretended not to look as he sighed loudly down onto his seat. Again, despite the outward show of fragility, he seemed to flow into position. The bench didn't even creak as he settled his weight into place and neatly folded his hands in his lap. He too gazed out at the gravestone stretching out before them. As I was saying, it's beautiful, isn't it? All in that mellow granddad voice of his. It didn't seem reassuring now, though, right by her like someone speaking in an advert or narrating in a film. The thin man didn't speak loudly, but his words rumbled in her teeth and bones like the bass was turned up too loudly. Also, old and thin as he was, he seemed to fill the space next to Katie, and she had to fight the urge to shift away from him. She nodded neutrally, wondering what about this old guy was raising the hairs on her arms. I love this place at this time of year. He paused and inhaled deeply through his nostrils. A meeting of borders and the edges of things. An arm swept out dramatically. Here we are in a place where the living visit the dead. At a time when things stop growing and get ready to die away. Leaning forward so that he intruded into Katie's field of vision, he continued. That grave there, for example. She turned her head to see him pointing at the headstone he had been cleaning earlier. Edna Bradbury found out she had cancer when she was 34, knew it was terminal and made the most of her remaining time. Last six months of her life were the best, they said. To paraphrase the old line, the flame that burns half as long burns twice as bright. As I say, borders and edges. I remember her funeral well. Good turnout. Big blue sky, like today. She was well loved. Katie's unease was growing and her scalp started to prickle with sweat. She blurted out, So, do you come here often then? And winced. Nice one, Katie girl. Now you're using one of the oldest chat-up lines in the book on an old man. Go get your walking stick, hotshot, you've pulled. The thin man didn't laugh or smile as she expected. Oh, yes. He let the hiss drift out into silence. But then... You know I do. You've seen me here before, haven't you? Caught off guard, she flushed and started to sputter something, anything. He had held up a long-fingered hand to stop her and laughed heartily. <laughs> like a television Santa, she thought wildly. Ho, 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 merry funeral. Don't worry yourself, Katie. I'm not angry. She sat bolt upright at the mention of her name. What is this? Turns out we're a lot alike. Let me explain. How does he know my name? As the thin man reached into a pocket inside his blazer, Katie, thoughts and questions whirling, looked around the cemetery and realised this section was empty. It seemed no one, well, nobody except the weirdo all-stars on this bench, came to this forgotten corner. Feeling confused, and foolish, and somehow cornered. Her eyes traced along the path to the distant far entrance gates. Why don't I just get up and walk away? 
she wondered, and felt her thigh muscles tensing to rise. The magazine the thin man placed across her legs stopped her as surely as if he had just dropped a granite gravestone onto them. On the front, corpse-like in blaring close-up, the anguished face of Felicity Royal tilted upwards as if appealing to the word peep burned blockly across the top in lurid tabloid red. Felicity's slender neck drew the reader's eyes down to the bold white capitals of the headline, Royal Agony. The thin man leaned in close, his scentless breath tickling Katie's cheek. Now that is simply going to leap off the shelves, don't you think? He sat back, and Katie could feel his eyes on her. Good work, Katie. She felt relieved when sudden anger extinguished her fear. She turned on him. What the fuck is this? Are you some kind of sick stalker or something? The thin man merely smiled at her. Do you work for the royals? Some kind of private detective? She waved the magazine in his face and almost shouted. This is next month's edition. It's not even out yet. How did you get this? Maddeningly, the thin man merely straightened his tie and replied calmly. Let's just call it a special edition. Advanced copy. I don't see why you're so upset. It's a splendid piece of work. Why didn't you calm down and turn to page three? What? You listen to me, you... It's a beautiful photograph. He interrupted smoothly. But then you already know that, of course. Go on, enjoy the fruits of your labours. You work at Peep, don't you? Or you know someone there? Someone who got you a copy? Katie tried to hold on to her anger and the strength it had given her, but felt it slipping away, and she didn't resist when the thin man slipped the magazine from her hands. When she looked up, he was holding open a double-page spread. The headline ran, The pain and grief of a star above her photograph, undeniably beautiful, but now awful in that beauty, a very public window into a private moment. Katie imagined people uttering mock sympathy as they bought it along with their cigarettes and chocolate, women chatting about the tragedy as they waited for their hair to dry in salons, social media sites discussing what the widow was wearing and whether her jewellery complemented her dress and shoes. Then someone else would die or become pregnant or get married or divorced or just fall out of a taxi drunk and Felicity Royal's endless pain would be binned and forgotten. Katie felt sick claustrophobic and leaned back trying to see the sky through the maze of branches arching over the bench patches and flickers of blue only increased the sense of suffocation the trees hemming her in with her shame the thin man stood smoothly unrolling from the bench tugging his suit into shape over his frame he folded peep and tucked it into his jacket pocket I have been to so so many funerals in here and over there, of course. He gestured to the gate leading to the private section. But the memories always fade. He gestured at the grave he had been standing over earlier. Like inscriptions on headstones. Katie tried to think of something to say, to ask how he knew about her, but couldn't. The thin man sniffled the air. Yes, summer fades and autumn waits for its turn. And here we both are. Borders. See? He began to stroll away. Wait! It's not right! Katie shouted as a thought suddenly struck her. She jumped up from the bench as a thin man stopped. The photograph. It's the wrong one. I mean, you're in it. Keith, I mean, the editor. He said you'd be airbrushed out. Yes, and I will be. I don't crave attention. I like to go about my business quietly. You got hold of a copy weeks before publication, with a non-edited picture. What the hell is your business? And that wasn't a rough edition you showed me. That looks like a finished product. The thin man half turned to show her the profile and grin she knew so well. Like I said, special edition. Katie merely stared as he glided away, his suit dark and lopsided against the white gravel of the path sauntering like a man half his age. Still, she watched as he went through the gates, turned left and disappeared. What the hell? 
She breathed and slumped back onto the bench. Her brain whirled as she tried to rationalize it all. So who was the thin man then? Convinced he had some connection to Peep, she rose, intending to drive down to the office right then and demand some answers. But the gravestone the thin man had taken such an interest in earlier caught her eye. Edna something, the cancer victim. He said he attended the funeral on a day like today. She hesitated. Go on then, you morbid cow. Go have a look, then get the hell out of this place. Perhaps she was a relation of his, she reasoned, and there'll be some clue to who he is. Just what kind of clue she didn't know, however, and suppose she was just trying to justify her grim nosiness. As she expected, despite the thin man's efforts, the inscription was mostly illegible. The lettering eroded. She looked around and saw that most of the graves were unkempt and unloved here in this older part of the cemetery. She frowned, suspicion darkening her thoughts. Peering close, she made out what must have been part of a name. Adbury. That's right, Edna Bradbury. Weather and Moss had claimed most of the other writing, but when she licked her thumb and rubbed at indentations near the bottom, Katie revealed a date chiseled neatly into the granite. September 1st, 1897. Nice blue sky that day was there, Mr. Thin Man. Bullshit. She stood up with satisfaction. I knew you were full of it, bloody old creep. Katie set off down the path with renewed purpose and was actually smiling as she emerged from the tree shade into bright, clear sunshine. Of course, I bet he saw my name as photographer in the magazine. As to how he had known she would be at the cemetery, she still didn't know, but supposed vaguely that he would expect her to revisit the scene of the crime as her mind put it without thinking, and returning guilt watered down her satisfaction. How he knew she'd be here today, well, it could have been sheer luck or... To hell with that for now. Just get to the office. She nodded, convinced, and clanged the iron gate shut behind her. That bloody editor or someone has got some talking to do. Despite the pinch of chill in the air, borders see, Katie wound the window down to let some welcome breeze into the car. She hadn't decided what to do once she knew who the thin man was, but for now, knowing would be enough. She took a left off the main road onto a residential street to avoid the lights at the crossroad junction and immediately regretted the decision when the car she had been following suddenly stopped. Bloody idiot! I nearly went into the back of you! She shouted out of the window, then immediately pulled her head back in when she saw what the reason was. She barked out a hard laugh. <laughs> what? Unbelievable. A funeral procession of a hearse and dozens of mourners slowly made their way up the street. What is it about funerals at the moment? She thought, but didn't speak out loud. For a deep, delicate quiet enveloped the scene, with only the thrumming of the hearse's engine and the occasional scrape of a shoe breaking what would have been utter silence. The lights of the car in front went out, and Katie turned her own engine off as a mark of respect. Local residents peered out of bedroom windows or came to their gates to watch, and Katie remembered herself before an automatic frown of disapproval formed on her face. Your days of being a hypocrite have long gone, I'm afraid. Better get used to a lifetime of not judging. The hearse, long and gleaming, glided past. The driver's face impassive beneath his peaked hat. Katie closed her window as the coffin, polished and new behind flawless glass, drew level with her car. White carnations spelled out, Grandma. Then the mourners drifted by, obviously a family, with adults and children huddled together, heads bowed. Many others followed a few steps behind, couples linking arms, men with awkward hands clasped behind their backs. The sense of loss ached in the air as the procession snaked towards the cemetery. Katie, not wanting to look but not knowing what else to do, thought about what the thin man had said about funerals being where death and life meet for a while. She glanced up at the cold, clear sky, especially at a time like this, at the edge of another season. The last of the mourners drifted by, but none looked her way. Car engines starting up broke the spell and Katie sat up straight, took in a big breath and turned the key in the ignition. 
The car in front pulled away, and she turned the wheel to follow, glancing in the rearview mirror as she set off. What? The lopsided suit, creased in the wrong places, the white hair combed back. Him! She almost stalled, the car juddering, recovered and looked again. At the back of the procession, appearing for all of the world like he belonged there, the thin man sauntered after the hearse. He didn't look her way. Bastard! She almost screamed, overcome with the fury she couldn't fully explain. His words came back to her. I have been to so, so many funerals. But how did he get here that fast? He did leave before me. Must have known about the funeral. Driven here, then slipped into the procession. She remembered a small girl in a dark grey dress, a grandchild probably, sucking her thumb, bewildered, carried by a weeping woman. She banged the steering wheel. Sick bastard! You and me, we are nothing alike, you parasite! All Katie could think about was getting to Peep's office and finding out just who the thin man was once and for all. She sped away and quickly caught the car in front. How about I photograph you again, thin man? Expose you in your own center page spread. Wipe that bloody smile off your face. Teeth gritted. She eased off the accelerator, cursing the slowness of the traffic. In the near distance, a traffic light showed amber, and she urged the car in front to get through before it changed to red. She realized that in her anger, she had blindly turned back onto the main road and was at the crossroads junction she had wanted to avoid in the first place. Damn it! This is the day from hell. Just let me get to that office. With maddening inevitability, the traffic light flipped to red just after the car in front squeezed through. Katie slowed, then cursed loudly and planted her foot on the accelerator. She just had enough time to register the protesting growl of her engine and the blaring of a horn before a bus loomed like a titan and smashed into her. The world boomed, jerked madly, then whirled as Katie's car crumpled in the bus's jaws, scraped sideways, then flipped onto its roof. In seconds, the scream of the bus's brakes and the squealing grind of metal on tarmac tightened into a single thin high note of pain. <laughs> Katie moaned as the upside down world grayed around her before the sharp, coppery stink of blood snapped her back. The seatbelt felt like a band of fire across her chest, and she panicked when she could only manage to inhale a faint whistle of breath. Dimly, she realized the pain needling through her body stopped at her waist. She bent her head up, trying to look at her legs, but they were lost in a tangle of metal, and her neck exploded in agony. Her arms, sleeved in blood, dangled down against the roof, and she started to cry when she couldn't make the move. She started to grey out again. The sound of her name was like a lifeline reaching out to her through the gathering darkness and blarily she caught onto it, trying to hold on. Come on, Katie. Open your eyes. Her eyelids, feeling raw and fleshy and so, so heavy, slowly lifted open and she squinted. Open your eyes. The voice came from the passenger's window where a figure kneeled silhouetted against the sharp glitter of daylight. The brightness hurt her eyes, but Katie strained to see, clinging to the voice. Come on, Katie. He knows my name, she thought dreamily. She blinked, willing herself to focus. Details started to sharpen out of the blur of light, her reeling brain trying to reassemble the upside-down elements into an image. White hair, a lopsided dark suit. A smile she knew so well. No, 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 please, no. She tried to turn away, but metal bit into bone and skin, and she nearly passed out again. Don't you worry, Katie, he said as she began to sob. I will be there. A Promise Lasts Forever by David James Narrated by Otis Gyrie.
produced and original score by Jesse Cornett. It's been a long time since I traveled down this old road. Hell, it's been a long time since I even came home at all. I knew I'd have to one day, though. I've known this day would come for a long time. After all, I'd promised I'd do this, and I've been many things in my day, but a liar is not one of them. I can still remember going up and down this road on my bike as a child with all my friends. We'd ride to the river that was only a few miles away and spend the entire day laughing, swimming, and just cutting up for the most part. Just before sunset, we'd usually flag someone down and hitch a ride home. Things were different then. You could stop a stranger in a pickup, throw your bike in the back, and he'd take you as far as you needed to go, so long as it was on the way or wherever he was headed. Actually, this road runs through most of the town, so no matter where you were going, it was probably on a person's way. Like I said, though, times were different back then. Simpler and more innocent. And then one day, they just weren't. I guess it's funny how change sneaks up on you that way, ain't it? I'll never forget the last day we all made that trip together. It started out as just a beautiful day as you could imagine. The sun came out early, and as soon as it did, the neighborhood kids started gathering down at the cul-de-sac. That was sort of our meeting place, where we would wait for everyone to show up and see who wanted to head out toward the river. None of us in this little town were what you would call wealthy, so our entertainment was what we made it, and that river was pretty much our playground. Just as he always had before, my little brother, Kevin, begged and pleaded with me to take him with us that morning, but as usual, I told him no. There was no way he'd be able to make the ride, and even if he did, I wasn't going to watch him the whole time we were there. I argued with him for a little while, but when it was done, I got my things together, grabbed a bite to eat, and headed down to the circle to catch up with everyone. The whole gang was already there, and even a few more kids from the adjoining neighborhood that I didn't know. We sat around and poked fun at each other for a bit until eventually someone asked if we were going to gossip like little girls all day or get going already. The few girls that already were there didn't take offense. People just didn't get offended over little stuff like that back then. Instead, they agreed by poking fun at the boys, too, and soon after we hit the road. It was a hot ride, and the sun was beating down hard. Passing pasture after pasture, we climbed one hill and coasted down the next, trying to catch a breeze and cool down. We jumped over the occasional driveway here and there on our bikes, and raced from one road sign to the next, mostly to show off in front of the girls. Eventually, we finally made it to the entire five miles down that old country road. Just up ahead, we could see the river, the water reflecting the sun's rays in the distance. As we approached it, everybody pulled off toward a little dirt trail that veered away from the road and wound under the bridge. Once you got down below the bridge, it was mostly sand, so you couldn't ride anymore. Instead, it was better to park your bike underneath so nobody could see it from above. After all, you never knew who was passing by, and you didn't want to get one of your bikes stolen or let the county sheriff know what you were doing either. The space under the bridge was a real sight for young eyes. There was graffiti everywhere, and some of the drawings were pretty well done. There were messages about people we knew, their older siblings, and even their parents from long ago. You could see beer bottles scattered about and fishing lines tangled on the old posts while listening to the sound of vehicles crossing above from time to time. Occasionally, we would act as if we knew exactly what kind of car was passing by, and even sometimes whose it was, too. To any adult, that place was probably just a mess, far better off left alone. But to us? Well, to us, it was a whole new world, where even an empty beer bottle was worth picking up and giving a look. 
I had managed to stock my tackle box quite well with all the old lures I found dangling about as well. After hiding our bikes well underneath and taking a moment to snack on whatever people had brought along, we made our way toward the river. The water was a little too rapid under the bridge, but there was a place not too far away where it was just right. Following the trail, you'd enter a small patch of woods, and the river snaked around a few times. After a short trek, you'd come to a good clearing and a sandy beach that was quite secluded, and far enough from the road that you could still hear it without being seen yourself. This was our spot, and was probably the spot for many before us as well. You could relax on the sand or step right down into an area deep and calm enough to be safe. Just across the river was an old rock where a tree had grown outward and reached over the water. And the limbs stretched almost far enough out to hit dead center, too. On one of the larger ones was an old rope swing that had been there for as long as anyone could remember. We used to joke that the rope swing was probably there before the river itself and that they had just built the river around it. The day unfolded just like any other before. We swung into the water again and again, trying to see who could make the biggest splash. Everybody got dunked at least once, some more than others, and there were a few shorts and tops which were briefly lost but quickly recovered. As happened every time, someone told the girls there was a snack in the water next to them, and they screamed and jumped as usual. The days were pretty much the same when we came down here, but that was just fine by us. We had a great time. As the sun passed overhead and the hours flew by, little by little the crowd began to thin out. We were still kids, and some of us had to be home at a specific time, whether it was to go somewhere with our folks or just check in. It must have been around 6.30 when the last of us began making our way back to the bridge to grab our bikes and start heading home. When we did get there, we sat around for a moment and finished the rest of our snacks, discussing things like who could stay underwater the longest. It was while we were eating that one of the girls, Cindy to be specific, pointed out some graffiti on the far underside of the bridge. Stained in a dark, almost maroon shade of red was written, R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. Cindy began to read it out loud, but one of the boys interrupted her immediately. I wouldn't do that if I were you or else Clyde Manning's going to come for you. Everyone got quiet. Uh, okay. Who the hell is Clyde Manning? She asked with a roll of her eyes. Apparently, she didn't know. But everybody else sure did. You see, stories like that don't die in a small town, no matter how old they may be. And even though you didn't hear a lot of talk about it, the story of Clyde Manning was common knowledge around these parts. Cindy was new, though, and had only lived here a few years, so it made sense that she didn't know. We all gathered around and took turns telling whatever parts of the story we had heard. Clyde Manning, or Killer Clyde as everybody had called him, had lived not too far from here about 30 or 40 years ago. He had been an odd man from what I had heard, and judging by the old photos I had seen, not the friendliest looking fellow either. I would seen his picture before, and from it, I knew that he had medium length red wavy hair and freckles scattered about his cheeks. His face appeared to be sunken in, and his body was tall and lanky. He looked bony, almost like one of those girls you'd see in a magazine who hadn't eaten for years. Clyde had lived in an old shed right outside of his parents' farm and kept mostly to himself. Sometimes he would drive around town in an old pickup truck that belonged to his pa. Clyde had worked at a neighboring farm a few miles down the road and occasionally people would see him walking back and forth in the morning, going to and from work on the days he didn't have the truck. To this day, folks still tell tales of how creepy he looked just strolling down the old road. Around the time Clyde was working that farm, people began to go missing. Sometimes it would be somebody's wife that appeared to have left an abandoned car on the side of the road with a flat tire. Other times it could be a stranger that was just passing through town. Either way, people just 
disappeared and always seemed to be on that same road when they did. There was a brief investigation regarding each missing person, but in those days you couldn't do much without a body. As far as the police knew, these folks could have just up and left on their own. Heck, who knew if the so-called passers-by were even here at all? One night, though, all that changed, and they began taking the claims seriously. The sheriff's son had been on his way to a girlfriend's house when something must have happened to his car. It was found abandoned about a mile before her house by one of the county deputies. Usually, that wouldn't be of concern to anyone, but with all the recent excitement and rumors of missing people, there was a search party formed immediately. They combed the woods, looked down by the river, checked with all of his friends, but there was nothing. Nobody had any idea where he was. After knocking on doors and asking whoever answered if they'd seen anything at all, a common story began to unfold. Although nobody had seen the sheriff's son, they had all seen Clyde Manning riding up and down that road. After hearing that more than a few times, you can believe that it didn't take long before the police began to wonder if just maybe this supposed killer they'd been investigating had actually been right here all along. All the police rushed down to the Manning farm and surrounded the home. Rod Manning, come out with your hands up! Banging on the doors, they began shouting that they were there for Clyde and to send him out immediately. His parents came outside to see what the police needed Clyde for, but they claimed to have no idea where he was. The police had all assumed he lived in the main house with his parents, but he didn't. He had been staying in that little shed out back for a long time. When Clyde saw all the police surrounding the farm from his shed out back, he crept out to his father's truck and was able to escape unnoticed. He jumped in the old pickup and began his getaway. That drew attention, though. The police could see that old truck barreling down the drive with a cloud of dust surrounding it that could probably have been seen from a mile away. It was probably only a minute or two before there were six or seven cruisers right on his tail. The police were all around Clyde as they began pushing and bumping the truck, trying to force it from the road. Clyde made it about a mile or so, trying to fend off the convoy of cruisers around him, before he came up on the bridge. Now, this bridge isn't a big one, and it's hard enough for two cars to cross it at the same time, much less have seven or eight of them playing derby on it. Who knows if he realized it or not, but old Clyde's truck never stood a chance of making it over that bridge. Somewhere about midway across, one of the deputies came ramming into the side of his truck. And the impact was about the last one that old Uncle Metal could take. The left front tire buckled beneath the frame, and as soon as it did, the truck began uncontrollably weaving back and forth. It collided with the left wall of the bridge, then shot back across the right side, hitting it with even more force smashing against the side walls with an extreme amount of force. Clyde blew two more tires and ripped the front panel right off the vehicle. As it grinded up against the side and skidded further down the old bridge, a piece of steel sticking out of the bridge railing snapped the front bumper of Clyde's truck. It didn't bend the railing a bit and it didn't let go of the truck either. The steel jerked the truck one final time into the wall and swung it around in a clockwise motion. The truck exploded through the wall and flew into the air before dropping down and smashing under the rocks below. When the police finally got down there, it was a horrific scene. The truck was crushed, parts of the cab were already on fire, and most people were rubbernecking from a distance in case it exploded. Despite everything, though, Clyde was still alive inside. They could hear him somewhere in that mess screaming in agony as the flames just got hotter and hotter. Nobody knew what to do. 
They just stood there as if each man was waiting for the next to do something. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, to the shock of everyone, Clyde came crawling out of an opening underneath the cab. Jaws dropped as the crowd witnessed Clyde emerge from a pile of steel and flames. They all assumed he couldn't get out. There he was. His face had been cut up on one side and his arms were horribly burned. Blood dripped profusely from the side of his head and he lurched and staggered as he tried to stand up. When he did, he began mumbling something as he approached the officers who were still standing there, gaping in both amazement and fear. Before he could reach them, though, one of the officers drew his gun and fired, hitting Clyde Square in the chest. As soon as he did, every officer followed suit. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! When it was all over, Clyde lay there on the riverbank with 40-something bullets in him, as dead as dead can be. The way the story goes, one of the officers went over to check his body and make sure he was dead, and in doing so, got Clyde's blood all over his hands. He went to wash it off in the river, but just before he did, the officer stuck out his blood-soaked hands and wrote, R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning, on the bridge in Clyde's own blood. Somewhere beneath that spray paint writing over there and a few other layers of different colors that had been rewritten through the years is the original writing in Clyde's blood. The thing is, after Clyde was gone, the disappearances didn't stop. They were less frequent, but every few years or so, someone would go missing, and they were always reported as being last seen around here. Every now and then, people would even claim to see old Clyde's truck leaving the area where the missing person was last seen. People would whisper that if you went down to the river and started talking about Clyde, and maybe even read the writing on the bridge, he just might come for you. After we finished telling the story to Cindy, it got all quiet. We all sat there for what was probably just a minute or two, but felt like much longer. It was as if everyone was waiting to see who had the guts to speak first. Eventually, Cindy stood up and began laughing hysterically. Are you guys serious? I mean, don't tell me you're afraid of a ghost story, are you? Killer Clyde Manning? She chuckled in sarcasm. She continued laughing and walking over towards the writing on the bridge, but the rest of us just sat there. Nobody was going to admit it, but we were afraid. Cindy wasn't from here, though, and she wasn't going to subscribe to any legends we had to tell. She reached up, placed her palm right on the writing. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning, she said over and over, laughing and mocking us for being cowards. She kept on and on until finally one of the boys said that it was time to be heading home. When he said that, we all found our voice again and just shrugged off Cindy's taunts as being dumb and immature. Gathering our bikes from the sand, we began pushing them out from underneath the bridge and followed each other back toward the road. Cindy, still snickering, eventually followed as well. Just like any other time, we began pushing our bikes back instead of riding them. When we would come to the river, we would be full of energy and excitement to get here. But usually by the time we left, we were pretty much just tired. It was the two boys out front that first flagged down someone and asked for a ride home. A nice older lady, I didn't know, pulled off to see what they were waving at her for. It only took a minute before she agreed to take them back home. She had said she was traveling to the local general store anyhow, and didn't much mind giving them a ride. Next, two more of us, a boy and a girl, were able to get a ride from someone that was delivering a trailer full of hay. He told them that he'd give them a ride, as long as they didn't mind sitting in the back with the hay. They didn't mind, they preferred it actually, and just like that, they were gone as well. At the beginning of the day, there must have been yeah, about 20 of us, but now our ranks had dwindled down to three. 
It was just me, Cindy, and Tommy, who lived just a couple doors down from me. Cindy suggested we flag down the car, too, but Tommy and I thought maybe we'd want to race up another hill before we did. Eventually, we all agreed that we'd do one more race, all three of us, and then flag down a ride when we were done. Soon after reaching this consensus, the race began. We took off quickly, and I passed Tommy within a few seconds. Cindy and I were next to each other, going back and forth, as one of us would get ahead for a few seconds, only to go glance back and see the other closing the gap again. Pedaling as quickly as we could, we got closer and closer to the sign on top of the hill. Eventually, I pulled ahead for the last time. It took everything I had, but there was no way I was going to let a girl beat me. I'd never hear the end of that one. I stopped on top of the hill, and she caught up shortly thereafter. We both rested to try and catch our breath. In the distance, you could see the road as it began to flatten out for a couple of miles ahead. There wasn't much to look at except for empty pastures. Even most of the cows had retired to their barns for the night by now. Behind us, I saw Tommy, who was off to the side trying to fix something on his bike. Looks like his chain popped off, Cindy said. She was right. From what I could see, he looked to be trying to get it back on as he pushed slowly, holding the side of the cranks. Glancing down the road ahead, I could see there wasn't anyone coming, so I told Cindy just to wait there, and I'd go help Tommy. When we both got back, we could try our luck finding someone to give us a lift. I coasted back down to meet Tommy. He was still tugging on the chain and cursing up a storm as if the sheer force of his frustration could somehow make it pop back on. We spent a few minutes working at it together before we finally got it back in place and started making our way towards Cindy again. From what we could tell, she was still up there waiting for a car to pass by. Just then, Tommy pointed something out. Cindy was walking up the road as if someone was approaching. We both stopped, cupping our eyes to try and see through the glare, and as we paused a minute, we could see somebody pull up. She's not going to leave us, is she? Tommy shouted as we both began rushing toward the top of the hill. We were almost there when we saw something that made us both stop dead in our tracks. We watched motionless as an old gray truck pulled up to Cindy and stopped in the center of the road. Cindy looked into the truck and just stood still. Even from our position down the road, we both noticed the look of pure horror that spread across her face. The driver's side door opened and out stepped a tall, red-headed, deathly-looking man. As he rose out of the cab, a wide grin exposed his rotten teeth. He walked over to Cindy, and as he did, she began screaming at the top of her lungs. We could see her kicking and punching, but it was no use. The man grabbed her and lifted her up over his head like she weighed nothing. After holding her there for a moment, still kicking and screaming, he slammed her into the bed of his truck. When he did, you could hear her body pound hard onto the steel floor, and the sound echoed through the valley. As soon as the echo disappeared, the yelling stopped. It became completely silent. As we stood there watching, too terrified to move an inch, the man crossed back in front of his truck and looked straight at us. He laughed for a moment. Then he got into his driver's side again and began to turn the truck around. Suddenly, I found the courage to move again. Gesturing frantically, I shouted at my friend, Tommy, it's Clyde Manning. Tommy and I both jumped on our bikes, pedaled as fast as we could towards the truck, which had already completed a three-point turn and was preparing to head its way back, that it came. We were quick, I mean quicker than we had ever been, and we must have gotten to the top of the hill only 30 or 45 seconds after he pulled away to the other side. When we reached the summit, though, and peered over the other side, there was nothing. You could see for miles down the road, and there was just nothing. No Cindy, no truck, nothing. It was as if he had just disappeared. We spent that night down at the sheriff's office, carefully retelling every single thing that happened that day in as much detail as we could recall, right down to the exact species of tree we'd peed on by the river. They took it all down, but refused to believe that we saw what we said we saw, or at least who we said we saw. We both begged and pleaded them to believe us. 
We knew Cindy could still be alive out there somewhere. Still, all they said was that they'd look for a man that matched that description. They just refused to believe that we really saw Clyde Manning. Our parents were the same way. They believed we saw something. They even believed we saw someone take Cindy. But they theorized that it could have been some older boyfriend she'd been hiding from her parents or something. People even went so far as to recommend that since she was 14 years old, a little older than us, she might have run away with this guy and that they could be together hiding out. That theory stuck for a while, too, but one thing was for sure. Cindy was never seen again. Years went by, and eventually most of us grew up and went out into the world to start our own lives. From time to time, there would be a new disappearance around here, but it was always the same old story. No body, no suspect, and it seemed no willingness to admit that any crime ever even happened at all. I was in my third year of college when I came home to visit that summer, and I had mostly convinced myself to forget what had happened all those years ago. I was attending school halfway across the country and didn't make it back very often, so returning home felt nice. Pulling into my old neighborhood was almost refreshing. As usual, I knew Mom would have prepared a big dinner and the whole family would be there to greet me when I walked in. That's pretty much how it went, too. We ate a huge meal, sat around for hours talking about what everybody had been doing. Tommy, as it turned out, had opened a pretty successful restaurant about three towns over, and my parents had even been there a few times. My father had just recently hit his last year of work and was looking forward to finally retiring. My mother, on the other hand, was concerned Dad was going to be real bored, real fast, just sitting at home all day. Even my brother Kevin was grown up by now. He was in his senior year of high school and not really sure what he wanted to do next. He'd been dating a girl from school for a while now, and for the most part, his plans were just to be with her as often as possible. I didn't know her, but I knew the family. Her older brother and I played ball together when we were kids. I spent about two weeks relaxing around the house and helping with a few things that my dad wasn't able to do anymore, until eventually it was time for me to head back to school. I had signed up for a summer course, and it was going to start in a few days, so I wanted to get back in time to get resettled. Saying goodnight to everyone, I headed up to Kevin's room so that we could talk just a little bit more before I left. I didn't get to speak to him much these days, with both of us being so busy and all. When I got to his room, though, nobody was in it. I looked over towards the window and could see it had been left slightly open as if he needed to get back in later. It didn't bother me at first. After all, I snuck out plenty of times when I was a kid, too. If it hadn't been for his notebook, I would never even given the scene a second look at all. I noticed his notebook from school sitting on the floor in front of his bed. The front of it was labeled World History, and I began nosily flipping through it. The pages weren't schoolwork, though. They were love letters. I knew he had a few classes with his girlfriend and that they sat next to each other in class. I figured this was probably what they used to pass notes to one another, all while appearing as if they were actually studying. I laughed a little at first, reading it. There was stuff about how much they loved one another and how they would get married one day. As I curiously flipped through the notebook, you could even see how their relationship had progressed. The letters became a little more personal and private. At that point, I decided it was no longer my business to read. I figured I'd put it back, but before I did, I wanted to see the most recent writing they had exchanged. Kevin got out of school a little later in the year than I did, so most of the recent writing was from just a few days ago. It talked about how she was going to be leaving town for a few weeks with her family and how much she was going to miss him. He responded by telling her how much he wanted to spend time with her before she left. Eventually, they made plans to meet up with one another, but as soon as I saw the exact nature of their plans, my heart stopped. The plans they were making were for tonight, and my heart seemed to stop as I read that their arranged tryst was set to take place under the bridge. I read further as I saw the two of them joking about the story of Clyde Manning and daring one another to test it. Kevin mentioned how I had freaked out when I was young and claimed to have seen Killer Clyde. I felt this feeling inside my body as if the room temperature had just dropped to below zero. 
My head began pounding. My hair felt as if it was standing up on end and I was frozen in fear. That memory from all those years ago consumed me from within, and all of a sudden I was a child again. I looked over at the window and noticed his car wasn't in the driveway. Maybe I can go get to them before it's too late, I thought to myself. I had no idea how long ago he had left, but I know that I had to go find them and I had to go now. I ran to the kitchen and grabbed my keys. Rushing toward the front door, I passed by my father's office and thought of his pistol. He had always kept it there for protection, and I couldn't think of a situation in which protection might be more important than the one in the middle of which my brother and his girlfriend had placed themselves. Pulling every drawer out of the desk, I eventually found it. The gun had already been loaded, so I tucked it into the back side of my belt, ran to my car, backed out of the driveway, and headed in the direction of the bridge. On my way there, I tried to figure out what I was going to do when I got there. I began wondering if Clyde would even come, and I even began questioning if I really had just been crazy all those years ago. I could recall being told that I may have thought those things because I experienced such a traumatic event. What if they were right? What if I was crazy then, and what if I'm being crazy now, too? It didn't matter, though, I told myself. The only thing that mattered was that I got there as quickly as I possibly could and did whatever I could do to make sure Kevin and his girlfriend were safe. Speeding over the hills, I counted them as I drew closer and closer to the bridge. It had been years since I traveled down this way, but I remembered every hill, every mailbox, everything. Cresting the final hill, all of my nightmares abruptly came terrifying reality. There was the old bridge, and there was Kevin, and pulling up beside him in the center of the road was the same old beat-up truck I had seen when I was a child. I must have been driving 100 miles per hour as I approached that bridge. Just before I reached it, I slammed on the brakes close to where Kevin and his girlfriend were standing on the side. The truck was only five or six feet away. I reached beneath my car seat to grab the baseball bat I stashed there for protection and jumped out of my car. Just as I rose to my feet on the road, Clyde stepped out of his truck, too. I ran up toward them as fast as I could with my eyes locked on Clyde, who was now making his way around the front of his truck. I was yelling at Kevin and his girlfriend to run, but they just stood there in that state of frozen fear paralysis I remembered so well. Clyde and I both reached them at the same time. Get away from him, I shouted as I extended the bat behind my back preparing to swing. I'm warning you, Clyde, get back! Clyde just looked at me, though, and grinned wide from ear to ear. When he did, some of the old wounds on his face began to tear open, and a little blood oozed out of them. His attention was on me now. He stepped right in front of me and threw his arms out wide, inviting my challenge. I saw the burn scars covering them, and his motion blew a breeze with the scent of rotting flesh into my face. It was all I could do not to vomit. I wasn't afraid, though. I let out a loud roar and swung the bat at him with every single muscle I ever knew I had. <laughs> Instead of connecting with him, though, the bat flew right through his body. It felt like I was swinging through heavy fog. The energy from swinging so hard and connecting with nothing caused me to fall forward towards him. Instead of actually falling into him, though, I fell right through his body and crashed up against the side of his truck. When I hit the truck, it took me a moment to come to. When I did, I swung at him again and again and again until I was completely out of breath. Just like that very first time, though, my weapon went right through him and he stood there undeterred, laughing at me. When I could swing the bat no more, he reached out with his decomposing arms and grabbed me by the throat. I felt his entire hand wrap around my neck as his claws dug into the back of my skin. I felt helpless in his grasp. He lifted me up about three feet off the ground and pulled me forward, so closely that our noses almost touched one another. I could see the bone from his skull through an open tear on his face. I noticed something moving inside the gashes as if maggots were actively feeding on his flesh. In his eyes, I could see my own reflections as I remained helplessly dangling midair in his grip. 
Clyde gritted his teeth at me and snarled with saliva bubbling from his mouth until he began to speak. I'm not here for you, boy. You didn't call me. And with that, he tossed me 15 feet down the bridge as if I weighed nothing at all. My brother and his girlfriend suddenly found their voices again and began to scream. Clyde reached out towards my brother and lifted him above his head, just like he had done to Cindy all those years ago. He slammed him down into the truck and instantly Kevin was silenced. Just then, I remembered the gun that was now poking into my back as I lay on the ground on top of it. I staggered to my feet, still hurting badly from the fall, and pointed that pistol at Clyde. I'm going to send you back to hell where you belong, Clyde Manning, if I have to drag you down there myself. Do you hear me? Look at me, Clyde. I'm going to kill you, I promise. Clyde just laughed. I could do nothing at all to him, and he knew it. I shouted at him as loudly and as vehemently as I could, but he just ignored me. He passed by Kevin's girlfriend and started making his way back to the driver's door. Before he could get in, though, I emptied the entire clip into him. Yelling and screaming, I watched as every single bullet passed right through him just as the bat had a moment ago. It was futile. It did nothing. Before I could even try to understand how this was all possible, he was back behind the wheel of his truck, which then took off down the road. It was over. It was gone again, and now, so was my brother. The rest of that night was a nightmarish deja vu of what had happened so many years ago. The police that had come when I was a young man were now long gone, but the new ones were pretty much the same. They interviewed us both, Kevin's girlfriend and I. They took our statements and, for the most part, didn't believe a word we said. We spent the next few weeks being interrogated and fending off accusations that we had something to do with my brother's disappearance. As time passed, though, even the investigating of us ceased. The general feeling seemed to be, as if I could almost have predicted, as simple as no body, no case. Over the years that followed, I watched my parents struggle with the loss of their youngest son. Occasionally, I could see it in their eyes that they desperately wanted to believe my story, but it was simply too much to comprehend. I didn't blame them for that, though. After all, who could readily believe such a story? I heard that the girl my brother loved so much all those years had been able to cope with it all. Eventually, she ended up in a psychiatric hospital only to take her own life a few years later. Sometimes I wonder whose ending was worse, hers or Kevin's. The years passed, and from time to time I would occasionally hear a new report about someone else who had gone missing, but there were never any leads and never any bodies. I witnessed my mother and father grow old and pass away without ever finding the answers they desperately needed to make peace with their tragic loss. Not long after they passed, I left this old town for good. It wasn't easy hiding what I had known to be true all along, but in life, we all do what we have to do to move on. We don't have much of a choice. I settled down about 250 miles away, got married, and raised a few children of my own. The time spent raising my own family was the greatest time of my life, and I was almost able to forget about what had happened on that road so many years ago. Almost. You see, I made a promise the night Kevin was taken, and that's why I'm here today. That's why I'm walking down this long road, and that's why I'm finally standing here in front of this old bridge that I haven't seen in a very long time. Almost 50 years have passed since that day Clyde and I last met, and I never forgot the promise I made to him. I lived a good, long life with few regrets. But three days ago, in a hospital room surrounded by my loved ones, I finally passed away as well. My physical life on this earth has ended now, and finally Clyde and I are on the same plane. The way I see it, it's due time I make good on that promise. I honestly have no idea why I couldn't fight back that night all those years ago. 
Why his being dead allowed him to touch the living, while the living were rendered powerless to touch him? I suppose it doesn't really matter now, though. Now that I'm dead, too, I can grab that evil son of a bitch. And I'm going to send him straight to hell. Just like I promised him I would. Laying my hand upon the writing on the bridge, I closed my eyes and screamed at the top of my lungs. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. Come on, you evil bastard. I definitely call you this time, didn't I? Let's finish this. And with that, I stepped into the middle of the road, raising my hands high into the air and grinning from ear to ear. As I watched a familiar old beat-up truck appear in the distance, driving down the road toward me. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.